Everybody, everybody, I make it two o'clock, so we will now start our full council meeting, which is going to be held for the first time remotely. The meeting is being held in accordance with the emergency legislation that enables the council to hold full council meetings remotely alongside the council's constitution and ensures that the council can continue to operate and make democratic decisions in an open, transparent way. I would like to remind members that this meeting is still being live streamed to the public. And can I request you all switch off your cameras and mute your microphones if you've not already done so, when you are not speaking directly to the committee to ensure there is no unnecessary background noise. All sections of the Members' Code of Conduct still apply to members in this virtual meeting environment and are as applicable now as they are in the traditional meeting setting. Can I also remind members of the meeting to ensure your chat functionality is switched on? And, you, and should you wish to speak on a particular item, to make your request clear in that area, using the raise hand facility for that particular agenda item. I will invite you to speak at the relevant point in the meeting where you can then unmute your microphone and switch your camera back on. I would like to make it clear that any decision made in this fully remote meeting should be considered the same as any other decision of the Council, provided that the meeting remains quiet and meets its legislative requirement to make a decision, regardless of whether a member of the meeting is unable to cast their vote due to technical issues. The meeting of the Council will remain valid. Any requests to raise a point of order can also be written into the chat bar. Voting will be conducted via the chat bar and ahead of the first vote, I will give a brief overview to members and the public of the process. Moving and seconding of items, make your intentions clear by typing moved or seconded into the chat bar. At this point, out of respect for all those who have passed away since we last met, including former member of staff Rob Gallivan and former councillor and past chairman of this council, Bob Wilcox. I would like to ask that we all observe a moment of silence. I would now like to invite Reverend Councillor Malcolm Lane to conduct prayers. Let us pray. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, we have remembered today those we have loved, lost and respected during this pandemic and before. And we give thanks for their lives, their service, their love and their humanity. We bring to mind especially those who have served this council, Rob Gallivan and Bob Wilcox, past chairman of this council. And we pray too for all those officers and staff who have lost loved ones as a result of this pandemic and other illnesses. So we may, and so may the souls of all the faithful departed who the grace and mercy of God rest in peace and rise in glory. And today, as we pray for this county council, for its officers, staff and its members, 
who have worked tirelessly during this pandemic emergency and under extreme difficulties. We ask you, Lord, that you would graciously grant us wisdom to determine amid the common and conflicting interests and issues of our time. We give you thanks for the great sense of working for the common good to ensure the welfare and true needs of all our peoples at this most difficult time and for a mutual respect one for another. We thank you, Lord, for the dedicated leadership of this council, from its officers and staff and its chairman and elected members, and those who lead this council and those in opposition, which ensures that engendered in us all is a keen thirst for justice and to do what is right, good and fitting. And so gracious Lord, give us all the ability to work together in harmony and especially when there is honest disagreement. And so we ask, especially at this stressful time, for a personal peace in our own lives and a joy in our task set before us today, despite its difficulties and challenges. And so, Lord, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit, that we as a council never lead peoples we represent wrongly, through the love of power or desire to please, or any unworthy ideals and motives. But laying aside all private interests and prejudices, we pray that we keep in mind the responsibilities we all have and we all share to seek to improve the conditions of all peoples whom we may represent. So Lord, may your kingdom come, your name be hallowed. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Malcolm. Before we move on to the agenda, I would like to thank everyone in Monmouthshire for their response to the crisis that faces us all. Especially we thank the officers and staff of Monmouthshire County Council for the exemplary service they have shown and their dedication to support all our residents. The work of the very many people who are volunteering in groups or individually is very humbling and we are all grateful for the wonderful support you give to each other. We have known that Monmouthshire remains one of the great counties of Wales and I am sure we can all be reassured by what has been achieved within our community. We'll now move on to the agenda. Apologies for absence can be recorded in the chat bar. If we have any already registered with Democratic Services, I will read them out. Which are Debbie Blakeborough. Sorry, no, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the meeting chat. Have we got any? Oh, sorry. Have we got any apologies recorded via Democratic Services at the moment? Um, None have been raised into the chat bar. I was reading out from a previous. Um, Chair, no, no apologies. We've not received any apologies. Thank you, Nicola. I'll give it a minute for anybody who wishes to put any in the chat bar. They will be recorded in the minutes. I have one from Councillor Matt Feekins. Thank you, members. The next item on the agenda is declarations of interest. These can also be added into the chat bar Members can indicate when during the meeting they want to declare an interest. I will invite them to, to um, I will invite them to make their uh, interest, declare their interest at that time, and they will receive a digital form from Democratic Services to complete and return. Public questions, item four, we haven't received any public questions. Chairman's announcement and receipt of petitions you have attached to the agenda. The chairman's the events that I've attended. And there are no petitions. Being presented today. 
So we move on to item six, which is the report from, of the Chief Officer for Resources. And it's about the refit program, phase one. Before I invite um, Councillor Murphy to introduce this item, can I remind members that there are exclusions of appendices four and five. So please do not refer to them unless we have excluded the press and public from these items. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, this uh, report is to secure the financial approval for the refit programme phase one. Uh, installing energy conservation measures or ECMs as they're referred to in all the reports um, across the portfolio of MCC buildings. Uh, there's a combined uh, eight year payback across the, the portfolio of buildings at a budget cost of up to 2.5 million, generating net energy savings to the council and reducing the operational carbon emissions. The approval to be installed is to fund the installation of the ECMs uh, with a Salix interest free loan from Welsh Government with repayments over a 10 year period to be covered by the energy savings generated and add the project to the authority's capital programme. The energy, energy savings of 25,000 from the refit were uh, in, installed into the 2021 uh, budget. In, in this sustainability budget mandate agreed by the Council. And the programme will play a vital role in delivering actions included in the MCC Climate Emergency Strategy adopted in October 2019 and the goals of the MCC Corporate Plan. The accelerated survey and implementation will make significant contribution towards the delivery of the Climate Emergency Action Plan actions and the SEDEX funding criteria requires an eight year payback generated with a net saving for the council. SEDEX loans repayments will be made from energy savings recovered from the energy budgets over a period of 10 years. An expression of interest was submitted to Welsh Government for the SEDEX funding of up to 2.5 million and this funding is available to the council subject to approval of a detailed application that had to be submitted by the 30th of June 2020. This date has now been extended to the 30th of September. The Delegated Authority for the Chief Officer of Resources to approve the SEDEX application and works phase following the production um, of the um, IGPs is sought to avoid delays at critical stages in the programme, thereby meeting the SEDEX funding deadlines and allowing works in schools to be completed during the summer holidays. Individual cabinet member approval was given on the 13th of June, uh, delegating decision making and management of the programme to the Chief Officer of Resources in consultation with, with myself as Cabinet Member of Resources so that we can, we can be as speedy as possible in implementing the stages, not just to get the, uh, the uh, savings, but also to get the, the ecological benefits that this programme will give us. So the energy savings from the refit program have been included in the sustainability mandate, as I said, and delays in implementation in 1920 have meant that the savings have had to be managed by other means. And the 1920 saving rolled into 2021 as part of the base. The impact of COVID-19 working restrictions are expected to delay energy savings further, creating an additional budget pressure in 2021. However, it's expect, expected that part year's energy savings will be achieved as the measures are installed before the March 21 and SADEX repayments and annual fees commence in 2021-22. Uh, members will be aware that in May 19, the Council declared a climate emergency. And as I've said earlier, this phased refit programme will implement an accelerated programme of energy efficiency improvements and renewable energy generation projects to reduce the carbon emissions necessary to deliver the, the climate emergency actions. So um, Chair, I'll just go back through the, 
um, the uh, recommendations. And if there are any questions from members after uh, Ian Hockham, the uh, Council's Energy Officer, is um, in this uh, program, uh, and he'll be able to uh, to answer any questions of a technical nature. So the recommendations to one is to seek approval to install a first phase of ECMs with a combined eight year payback across a portfolio of MCC buildings at a budget cost of up to 2.5 million, generating net energy savings to the council and reducing operational carbon emissions. To seek approval to fund the installation of, of the ECMs with a SADEX interest free loan from Welsh Government repayments over a 10 year period to be covered by the energy savings generated and add the project to the authority's capital program. And 2.3 to dedicate final approval for the funding and commencement of the work stage of the refit program to the Chief Officer Resources in consultation with the Cabinet Member Resources based on presentation of a detailed business case to the Chief Officer before the submission of the SADEX application. One other thing I would mention there, uh, uh, Madam Chair, which I uh, forgot to mention before, is that there are anticipated savings to the authority throughout this programme of uh, some £49,000 a year. So uh, not only will we get the uh, reduction in carbon emissions and other efficiencies, but we'll also have a substantial increase to the budget. So um, as I say, Ian Hockham is here to answer any questions that members might have. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. I see in that bar that Councillor Fox has seconded the recommendation which you've just proposed. Do we have any questions for Councillor Murphy or the officers? If so, please put them in the um, item six refill in the chat bar which says raise your hand to speak. I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a look at that just in case anybody's not uh, clear about it right. Debbie Blakeborough has indicated she'd like to speak. So if you'd like to unmute your microphone and your camera, Debbie, can I invite you in? Yeah, thanks, Sheila. Um, just very briefly, it's really just to say uh, I would definitely support this, even if there wasn't any financial gains from this. I think uh, anything that'll um, save energy and reduce carbon emissions is going to be a good thing. And obviously, uh, Mother Earth would definitely put those, their thumbs up uh, to this. Um, I think it's a win-win uh, interest-free loan from the Welsh Government as well. So, yeah, I would support this. Thank you, Councillor Breakburn. Anybody else wishing to speak? If not, we we can go to the vote. I'm getting a little bit of buzzing. Oh, Joe Watkins. Joe, I'm getting a little bit of buzzing on my computer. So if you see me making faces, it's probably because there's a buzzing every now and then. Um, right, Joe, can I invite you in? Thank you very much, Chair. Also, just to agree with what Debbie was saying, that this is a really worthwhile programme. I'm delighted that officers have moved ahead so rapidly to actually try and bring about energy savings within our portfolio of buildings. Um, and just one question. Um, I've, I'm aware that we haven't included all of our buildings within this. Are we likely to be looking at whether we are going to be able to do that in the future as well? Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Chair, do you want to bring uh, Ian in, in, in on that? Because yeah. he's, he's, doing, he's been doing a full appraisal of all of this. Can I invite yes. you in? Yes, thank Yes, the intention would be to roll this out across all the authorities' portfolio of buildings. Um, initially, we undertook a desk based benchmark and exercise to identify um, the buildings with the greatest potential for savings. So the, the, the ones with the, 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 say the worst energy performance, but uh, against uh, indicators like that. And because of the capacity of the, the, the service providers, we could only really look at doing, say, 20 buildings at a time in any one phase. So we started off with a prioritised phase. The intention is ironing out some of the, you know, the, uh, the, the first phase, kind of any, any issues that we might have with the provider, getting this all up and running properly. And as we're delivering this first phase, we can start to look then about doing uh, future assessments for, for other phases of other buildings, maybe even expanding what we can include in, uh, in the measures. Thank you very much. Thank you That's for that. Great. The next, sorry, my chat bar's bobbing up and down a bit here. 
can I invite in um, Councillor Watts. Watts was the next indicator they wish to speak. Thank you, Councillor Watts. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, I noticed in there the refit um, incorporates some of the schools. Thornmore School is one of them. And I wondered how that tied in with the uh, retrofit that we were supposed to be having to do with 21st century schools. So, for example, yeah, and you know I often talk about this, uh, when Thornwell School burned down, only half of the school was refitted with a sprinkler system, which seems to be a bit peculiar. Um, will we ever get a chance with this refit programme in the future to ensure that all our buildings are retrospectively um, fitted with sprinkler systems that, that require them? Thank you, Chair. I can't unmute. Thank you, I was trying to unmute. Um, yes, can we have a reply? Thank you, Ian. Oh, yeah, apologies. Thanks, Chair. Um, Thanks. 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 Yes, <laughs> uh, the, the refit programme itself is focused on measures that deliver energy savings and uh, carbon savings, um, meeting the criteria of the Salix funding from Welsh Government. So um, uh, items such as sprinkler system that wouldn't come under this programme. Um, the part of the, the, the side benefits of it is that we can deliver measures such as lighting and things like that that we might have to do in the future um, and take those out of capital uh, funding projects um, that might kind of uh, release more capital for addressing other measures. But um, when we've been getting this refit programme together, so, so the, perhaps the question on the sprinklers is a little bit outside the refit programme. However, um, I'm, I'm working with uh, uh, the colleagues in the states and property. So as we're identifying other issues that are still outstanding, we can we can kind of flag these up for maybe other kind of uh, uh, other property delivery programs. Um, and hopefully the refit program would take some of these other measures out that we might have to do in the future uh, and, and free up capital maintenance budgets to, to do these other things then. Sheila's moved in. She asked us. Has Sheila called me in yet? She, she moved in. Right? Yes, I have. Yeah. Somebody else just speak for a minute to say we're dealing with it. Councillors, hello, it's uh, Matt Phillips here, Head of Law and Monitoring Officer. Um, we just got a few technical issues with the, the Chair's um, laptop at the moment, but um, Councillor Eason, she was trying to call you in to speak, so if you wouldn't mind going ahead, please. Uh, my microphone keeps muting up. I'll, I'm going to change rooms because Jim is in the other room. I'll try now. Um, Am I OK there now? Oh, sorry. Um, th thank you for your report, Ian. Um, I'm, a gov I'm a governor on... Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to change rooms because I'm getting feedback from Jim. I'm uh, a governor of both the Scully Finn and the Dussel School. Dussel School wants, doesn't seem to have any problems for the future in terms of eco-friendly eco systems, except like these the, uh, windows still don't work properly. Regarding the Scully, regarding the Scully Finn, um, is there any plans in plan plans in place for a Scully Finn school to be um, included in these eco-friendly schemes? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I might be not talking properly. I'm, tr I'm trying to keep out of Jim's way. 
So yeah, so uh, uh, so Karen, so I think what we'll, we'll do, as as um, with some of the other buildings and that, we'll be looking to do another phase or, or, or more phases to roll out across other buildings. So um, uh, maybe ones like Juice, though, because they're newer schools, they might be a bit further along in those phases and they'll be more difficult to achieve savings. But for perhaps uh, as Golivin would be one that would be uh, uh, brought in at an earlier stage in, the, in future phases. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ian. I'm... Thank you, Ian. Can I invite Councillor Pratt in, please? It's not right, uh, thank you very much, Chairman. And can I thank Councillor Murphy and officers for this um, welcome report, which is going to make a significant contribution to our climate change emergency and our response for which I'm the cabinet member responsible. Um, so all this hard work that has gone into it and that it's been brought together um, fairly swiftly, um, can I thank them? I fully support it and it is very welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Park. Councillor Harris, would you like to come in now? Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, it's a no brainer. Um, we've absolutely uh, got to do it. In fact, it's, it's almost um, criminal if we uh, if we don't do it. I fully support it. Thank you, Councillor Harris. I'm just looking. I can't see anybody else has indicated they want to speak. So we will be going to the vote on that. But before we do, I will read out um, an overview about the procedures for voting. A survey will appear in the functionality on your screen, which is, if you scroll down, you will see that Wendy has put it in there for us under item six. And follow that by pressing submit button, submit vote button, which is in the middle of the screen now. Members have all received guidance ahead of this at the meeting on how to cast a vote and uh, should have this to hand if you've got any issues, but we're all here to help, don't worry. I will give all members of the committee a short time to cast their vote before confirming the result. And then we will announce that. But I will give you a little bit of time to do that one now, because obviously this is the first time we've done it this way. Um, we're all learning at the moment, big learning good. Thank you, if you'd like to start voting. Nothing's happened yet. So we're at a position now, you know, whenever you're comfortable, you can go back on and so in bank thank you judgment it's um it's it's so you can just convey um something how you can voice it publicly. Yeah, it's just very, it's very clear with that. Um, that's been good. Thank you, members. I've just received notification that that has been clearly approved. So thank you all very much for that. Um, we'll move on now to the next agenda item. Item number seven, report of the head of public protection. This is the Licensing Act 2020 public protection uh, policy statement, sorry, policy statement. And County Councillor Sarah Jones is the cabinet member who has responsibility for this area. Thank you, Councillor Jones. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, good afternoon, good afternoon members. Um, today, Council is being asked to approve our updated licensing policy statement. Um, and upon adoption, if that happens today, this will come into force on the 1st of July 2020. Um, members will be aware that our last statement was published in 2015. So that was over five years ago, well, five years ago now. And so it's our statutory duty to review that position. And consequently, I I'm, I'm provide you with that updated policy statement today for your consideration. Um, the report very clearly sets out the very strong consultation approach that has taken place. We first um, reported the draft report to the Licensing and Regulatory Committee back in November last year, 2019. Um, the revised policy was then issued out for consultation to a wide selection of stakeholders um, and public consultation, and it's been through a very due process in that regard. Um, and just to say, in terms of some of the comments, and you'll see them from the cover report, it's been um, a very welcome um, policy statement that's come forward from, from comments from stakeholders. Um, just in terms of some of the main changes on the previous document, um, you'll see those are highlighted in red in the policy statement. Um, as the cover report highlights, the most fundamental change, though, is around the removal of the cumulative impact policy for Chepsto. And the, the document itself highlights a very clear rationale as to why this is justified. Um, a very thorough and diligent process has been adopted in coming to that decision. And again, as I say, that's outlined in section 3.6 of the report and again is welcome and supported by our stakeholders. So members, just, just in summary, this is a very important document for us. It ensures we have the ability to make consistent decisions which take account of the wider guidance. Um, that we take account of collaborative approaches, that we ensure that all our applications are dealt with efficiently. And finally, it ensures that we continue to enforce the provision of the Licensing Act effectively. Um, I've got two officers with us today who will help in terms of fielding any questions. We have Dave Jones and Linda O'Gorman. I'd like to thank them both for the presentation, um, preparation rather, of the policy statement. But Madam Chair, if I could also just mention as an aside, I'd like to offer my thanks more widely to the public protection team. Um, licensing, trading standards, environmental health and public protection more widely have been doing a fantastic job over the last couple of months. Um, and I think uh, it's important that we recognise their efforts now and going forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jones. So we have, are you proposing the recommendation? Would you like to read out the recommendation or would you like me to? I can read out the recommendation. So the recommendation members is um, that you approve the updating licensing and policy statement for adoption by Monmouthshire County Council to come into force on the 1st of July, 2020, attached as Appendix A. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. And I see we have a seconder. Uh, Councillor Greenland has seconded that. Would anybody like to speak or ask any questions before we go to a vote on this item? This is an item seven licensing policy it has now appeared in the chat bar and I raise your hand to speak. So I'll give you a couple of moments just to find it and indicate if you wish to speak before we move to the vote. gone very quiet. <laughs> OK, so perhaps we could then move to the vote on this item. So we'll, we'll take a moment now to wait for Democratic Services to put a, a vote in. Oh, I'm going to hand you over to our head of legal, Matt Phillips. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, sorry to butt in. Um, we just got a few problems with the vote function within the chat bar. So we're going to go a little bit more old school this time round for the vote um, and we're going to do it in the same style we would for a recorded vote. So I'm going to ask uh, Nick from Democratic Services to read through all councillors and then just ask you to just stick your audio on. There's no need for video. Just respond um, with, uh, with your vote to Nick and we'll record it that way. Thanks very much. If we could just hold for a second. Okay, hello everybody. I'll just call the names out and if you can stay if you're for, against or abstain. Thank you. Councillor Petruni. For. Councillor Becker. For. Councillor Blakeborough. 
Four. Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor okay. Clark. Yes, Councillor Smith has it. Yeah, right okay. I'm through. Councillor Clark. And we'll, perhaps if she's got any queries, we can have a word with them. Um, okay, I'll move on from there. Councillor Alan Davis. She can have a chat with them after the meeting. Oh. Councillor Dovey. Go to the report to the, the vote which Nicola is going to do for us. Then you speak. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dimmock. Four. Councillor Eason. Four. Councillor Edwards. Four. Councillor <coughs> Evans. Four. Councillor Fox. Four. Councillor Greenland. Four. Councillor Grocat. Four. Councillor Guppy. <coughs> Four. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harris. <coughs> Councillor Roger Harris. Four. Councillor Higginson. Pro. Councillor Howard. Four. Councillor Howarth. Okay, Councillor John, Richard John. Four. Councillor Laura Jones. Four. Councillor David Jones. Four. Councillor Penny Jones. Councillor Sarah Jones. Oh, yeah. oh. <coughs> Councillor Brian Jones. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Lane. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Pavia. Four. Councillor Powell. Councillor Pratt. Four. Councillor Roden. Four. Councillor Smith. Yes, apologies, Chairman. Uh, support, four. But this report will also be considered by the South Wales Fire Authority. I'm one of your representatives, and I didn't know whether you declare an interest or not. So, thank you. OK, um, Matt Phillips will get back to you on that one. Councillor Strong. Four. Councillor Taylor. Four. Councillor Thomas. Four. Councillor Trehan. Four. Councillor Watts. Four. Councillor Watkins. Four. Councillor Webb. Four. Councillor Williams. Four. Councillor Woodhouse. <laughs> Councillor Woodhouse. OK, that's, that vote's carried. Sorry, I was mute. <laughs> I was having a conversation with the head of legal. Um, or... Yeah, great. That's, that's the, that vote's carried. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. That was clearly carried. Thank you all very much. And as... Um, Nicholas said, well, Head of Legal will get back to you about your query. Thank you. So we move, can, can members please, anybody who hasn't got the microphone muted, please turn it off because we ha are having a few issues with the live streaming and with, with the, um, the connections because we do need cameras and microphones off to make it as, as efficient as possible for the transmission of this, uh, this meeting. Thank you all very much. Right, we move on now to item eight. Um, and we have the Chief Officer for Children and Young People annual report from Mr. Will McLean. Can I invite you in, please, Mr. Will McLean? Thank you, Will. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Council, for the opportunity to present uh, this Chief Officer's report um, this afternoon. Um, I think the first thing to say was that uh, once again, uh, I hope that members have found the report to be accessible and uh, provides them with a good oversight of uh, the activities in CYP uh, in the last year. Um, in previous years, I've uh, taken 
uh, the, the presentation and the report is circulated and uh, and presented slide by slide to you. But I'm very conscious that with 52 slides um, and on a new uh, technology platform, uh, that might not be the best thing to do this afternoon. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk to the report and then, of course, I'd uh, welcome the opportunity to address any questions that, that members might have. Um, I think the first thing that I'd just like to, to talk about really is just the purpose of the report though. Um, and one thing which will be a, a frequent refrain um, from me during the, this afternoon is the, the extent to which the uh, evaluation and the accountability framework has changed in Wales over the last year. Um, I think it's, it's really important that we recognise that. So I'll spend a little bit more time as I talk through um, how we're describing um, our school's outcomes and particularly with key stage four, um, that is the end of statutory education, um, how we're giving account for where our schools have performed uh, with regards to that. Um, the other areas which are kind of common areas for comment um, in the Chief Officer's report, I will touch on, um, and they include attendance and exclusions, uh, the impact of leadership in our schools, um, the key matter of safeguarding, which is obviously fundamental, um, the finances and our focus for the coming year. Um, I think the, if I were to focus for you just on a, a couple of key reflections and my reflections on the year are, are found on, on slides um, eight to 11. And, and really, I think uh, it just, it's important to stress that the focus now for um, education services right across Wales is really very sharply on the experience that learners have in their teaching and learning. Um, the experience that they have, the progress, the progress that they make uh, is the critical aspect as opposed to a blunt end of key stage um, analysis of a level made or a grade achieved. And I think that's really important. It brings significantly more nuance into the uh, frameworks that we operate, but it's also presents some challenges in terms of how I present uh, the outcomes to you in terms of our uh, accountability. Um, I think uh, it's important also to note that uh, despite the, the huge challenges that education faces uh, at the moment as a result of the COVID pandemic, we're also working very hard uh, to, to meet our contributions um, of the national government's reform agenda. The national mission remains our, our key focal point and we're doing all we can to contribute to that uh, as best we can. So in terms of where I think we got to in 1920, I think the first thing to say is that it's really clear that we see continued and sustained performance at a high level in a range of measures across all of our schools. And in some schools where performance hadn't been at the expected level, we've seen significant improvement there. And that gives me confidence that many of our schools are on a secured and continuous improvement journey. I think as an authority, um, we've developed a really strong and robust approach to how we use the schools causing concern process. And that actually allows us to see schools develop quickly through that route. And we've become very effective at how we uh, use our statutory powers as set out in the Education Acts. Our schools are improving in terms of the outcomes that they achieve uh, in their estimate inspections. And I'm really pleased to note that uh, of our recent uh, tranche of inspections over the last year, we've seen schools now emerge um, on the whole with five goods across the five areas of inspection. And I think that's really positive and actually marks significant progress um, for the school settings themselves. It's also good to note that we have no schools in a statutory category, so no schools are in special measures or in significant improvement. And we only have three schools in Estin Review and that compares very favourably to both the region and the national position. We have seen a real step forward in how we work with our schools, and I think that's echoed, and I'll touch on the Estin inspection of Monmouthshire shortly, but that's really very clearly echoed in that Estin report. Um, but we're really seeing that in, in these extreme times um, that we've just experienced. I think that really close practical working relationship has been exemplified in the way that the hub schools were established, the collaboration that uh, has seen those operate so successfully over the last 11 weeks, um, but also, you know, and very, very early days in the preparation for a return to school, we're seeing really excellent collaboration between the authority and the schools and between clusters of schools to make sure that that takes place as effectively and efficiently and as smoothly for learners and for school staff as it can. And the final two points really, I think are that 
we're seeing a progression now whereby schools need less support um, from external agencies. And I think that's that's a really key marker for us. Schools are much more able to support themselves and to support each other. I think the recent investments that we've seen made by Welsh Government in professional learning stand us in very good stead for the future. And I think one key marker for me in the past, we've been a recipient of support from other local authorities. Uh, we've had instances where we've had to bring in head teachers to support our schools at very short notice, um, and that's been hugely welcomed. And I think record represents, I think, the, the strong collegiate nature that exists in the amongst the five former Gwent authorities. But I'm really pleased now that actually other authorities are coming to us um, to ask for reciprocal arrangements, reciprocal support of our leaders from our schools. And I think that really clearly marks out the progress of our leadership cadre over the recent years. I don't intend to spend a long time talking about the ESTIM um, report this afternoon. Um, I've included in the pack a very brief summation of the, the report itself. Um, I think all I would really say is that um, I was really pleased with the outcome of the report um, that was undertaken by Estin. I think it recognised the progress we made. I think it recognised many of the strengths, not least the way that we work with the AS and the work of our other services. So our early years support um, and our youth service. Um, but I think really it validated the direction of travel that we're taking. And I think it, it clearly identified areas for further improvement. And, you know, it would be you know, absolutely remiss of anybody to say, even hint at suggesting that we were had made all the progress that we need to make. But they were in the areas where we knew we needed to make progress. And I think that validates our evaluation and our consideration of the services um, that we know we need to improve. So um, you'll see when we talk about the focuses for next year um, that um, Estin recommendations feature there, and that's absolutely right. Um, and through our uh, regular attendance at Children and Young People Select Committee, we'll make sure that progress with regards to those Estin recommendations is regularly updated to members there and as and when it's appropriate to full council as well. I think the final thing I just wanted to comment on was one of the things which uh, I reflected upon as I was doing this annual report was that um, annual reports are much easier to write if you're very clear and explicit about what you hope to achieve. I think uh, if you find yourself um, uh, putting vague up kind of aspirational kind of statements into place, then that makes your measurement very difficult. So one of the things that I'll be working on with my team in the future is making sure that we're absolutely explicit about what we hope to achieve in the coming years. The next part is really just to reflect back on what we did achieve in 1920, um, where we saw success and uh, those areas where we didn't see the level of success that we might have wanted to. So I've tried to, to, to make this um, clear for you as, as members, and we've used a, a fairly traditional kind of red, amber, green um, colour code in terms of the, our levels of success. Um, and you'll see there on the, the first one, which was to improve the outcomes of vulnerable learners, including free school meal learners, particularly at key stage four, that we have made an improvement in the last year and we have closed the attainment gaps um, in some key areas. However, you know, we are absolutely aware that there still remains significant work to do on this. Um, the way we give account for how our groups of um, learners perform will change. And I'll come on to talk about that a little later this afternoon. But I do think that uh, whilst we've made progress and the gaps have come down from the previous year where they were far too high, um, we still have a distance to go um, with that area. And the other part for us, and that this relates to the second um, area of focus, is really a re reducing the level of variance. Um, we have only got four secondary schools, and I would like to see the performance much closer amongst the four secondary schools. Um, that's got to be a key focus for us. We are within a fairly narrow band of free school meal entitlement, so we should be expecting a much more similar range of outcomes across the four. And I think it's really um, incumbent upon us to actually work with our schools to make sure that uh, we're sharing the very best practice in different areas, but actually we, we minimise that variance across the cohort. The third area <laughs> was to strengthen leadership capacity in some of our kind of identified schools. And I think we've seen significant developments in this area, and I'm comment uh, at greater length later on in the report about the impact of the change of leadership. 
Um, but it is fundamental. It's one of the things which we have very clearly seen. If a school is to progress and if a school is to deliver to its learners the very best outcomes that they can achieve, then we really do need to see strong leaders in our schools. I've mentioned that we're now kind of developing our leadership model and sharing that with other authorities. Um, we've also been the recipient from other authorities, and I think we've now got the strongest group of head teachers um, that we've worked with um, for a long time. And I'm really sure that they will, in the fullness of time, embed good practice, embed excellence, and we'll begin to see those excellent judgments um, that Estin talked about emerge in the future. One of the, um, the key changes in terms of the accountability framework is that we don't look solely at an end of key stage, but we look at the progress that learners are making on a more regular basis. And I think that uh, the, I've highlighted this box as amber to suggest that we've made some progress, but not all the progress we would have hoped. But I hope that when you read that box, you'll actually um, get that sense that we have made real progress in many areas, in many specific groups as well. Um, however, we do know that for some groups, such as our more able and talented, um, those who achieve five A star A's is lower than the previous two years. So I'm not going to claim that we've seen success there across the board. Um, I think it's really key that we actually recognise the fact that there are some areas that we still need to make progress in. Hence, that one has remained as amber. The final one on that slide refers to reducing the number of fixed term exclusions, and this has been a pressure for Monmouthshire over the last couple of years. We've recently invested significantly into our secondary schools to provide additional support from our pupil referral service, but there's no um, there's no op there's no way in which we can deny we have seen an increase in the number of uh, fixed term exclusions. This is uh, reported quite clearly later on in the report, um, and it's an area that we have to work on. It's an area that has to be worked on in a range of different ways. We have to work with our schools, our leaders. Uh, we have to work with classroom teachers to make sure that they're as equipped as they can be to manage behaviour in classrooms. We have to make sure that we've got the right type of support for schools in how they manage that in a holistic way. So that one clearly remains a red and will be an area of focus for us in the coming year. Two areas on the final slide, really, in terms of how we've done last year. In terms of the well-being, I think it's really um, positive to recognise the, the progress that we have made with regards to the well-being. There's a range of indicators that are cited in that box and I think we have seen genuine progress in terms of some of the key well-being measures for our young people in our schools. The final point is around equity in our learning and whilst we recognise that the progress of many of our learners is strong and we've seen that um, uh, our learners with additional learning needs in our SNRB bases make very good progress in their learning. This still isn't across the piece. So that piece around equity, the progress of those specific groups will remain a focus for us in the future. And that's clearly one of those areas that Esten identified um, when they were with us and undertaking the review. Um, the, the final three areas um, are kind of, I guess I'd suggest more kind of um, centrally focused um, and in terms of process really. They focus on the preparations for the new um, work which we're undertaking around the ALN Act, um, which has been a significant investment of time and will continue to be. Um, a key pressure for us in the future will be that the Welsh Government has retained the implementation date um, of next September for the new Act. Uh, that means that the new statutory posts have to be in place uh, in January 2021. So there is an awful lot of work for us to do then. However, I would also suggest to you that it is an opportunity. We know that Esther made the recommendation that we need to um, have a very clear vision and a very clear strategy for how we're going to achieve that. So actually, that opportunity to dovetail that renewed vision, that renewed strategy, along with the terms and expectations of the new legislation actually is timely. The final two are very much operational aspects with regard to um, how our children access our schools. Um, the, the penultimate one is regarding the development of Abergavenny. We have seen some challenges in terms of how that work has been undertaken. And obviously um, some of our partners who we've been working with have been impacted upon by the COVID group. Um, I do expect to see that accelerated in the coming months um, as we see um, some of our uh, partners and our commercial partners come back into line. Um, and I would very clearly say to all members that we will be beginning that process of engaging 
with a whole range of stakeholders about what they want to see within that school. What we submitted to Welsh Government set out um, some clear expectations in terms of our work around um, the nature of the school, it being a through school and so on, but we're now time for us to really get to the detail about what we want it to be and how we want it to function, how we want it to relate to the rest of the town. Um, and I think that's going to be a, a really exciting piece of work. And I think as we begin to emerge from the COVID um, crisis that we're in at the moment, I think that piece around Bambi will give us all something actually that we can identify as a significantly um, innovative and new area of work for us to, to focus on. The final area is with regards to the catchment and nearest school policy. Significant amount of work was undertaken on that area. We concluded the review of Monmouth and King Henry catchment areas, aligning um, different parts of the US catchment to, to both of those secondary schools. We do have some work to undertake in the future in the south of the county. However, at the moment, um, it's uh, all work is on pause until some amendments are made to Welsh Government legislation around consultations. Um, because at the moment you can't undertake a consultation when a school isn't open and then given all of our schools are closed that puts us in a slightly tricky position to take those forward but as an operational matter that remains very high on our focus. As we turn to the um, the set of slides now that really give account for the um, how schools perform if I could draw your attention to the first slide um, which is in the report pack um, which is the foundation phase, language literacy and communication slide. Um, in the slide deck, it's slide 18. Um, I think on the uh, pack that you have in front of you, it is on page, if you just bear with me a second, I'll find this for you. Um, because I think if I talk you through the first one, then I, I think the, the rest will, will hopefully fall into place. So it's on page 180 of your paper pack. So with regards to um, how we are now um, sharing our school's performance, this will be the model that we take forward. So schools will be anonymised. Um, we will be able to provide you with a comparative position for the region, for um, the EAS region. Um, we will not be able to provide you with um, national comparative positions, and we will not um, be able to provide you with aggregated local authority positions. So the days of me um, setting out to you that uh, potentially 92% of pupils have achieved the um, foundation phase indicator um, have passed now, but we will present the information uh, in this new way. So on that slide, you will see two graphic representations. The first graph sets out um, the performance um, of our children in literacy, language and communication. The orange highlighted schools are those schools from Monmouthshire. The grey schools are the EAS schools. Um, and I just probably just draw your attention to a couple of factors. Um, you can see the area that's highlighted on the left and I guess the red rugby ball shape. Um, those are the schools that have performed under expectation. And the expectation line is that dotted line. That's the line of regression and um, the line of best fit for performance across the region. So you can see there's a cluster of schools there, some of which are very low levels of FSM entitlement, which is what runs across the X axis. You can see that they have um, in a way underperformed in terms of what our expectations might be. In particular, you'll see one school there, which is on the 10% line of entitlement to free school meals. And you can see that at 70% of pupils achieving, that is significantly below the expectation. And the expectation for a school there would be circa 90%. So what happens when we receive this information from the AS is that we now have a very detailed conversation with the school that uh, has underperformed and we get into a very clear dialogue about the nature of that cohort, trying to understand what's happened. Has there been anything else in that year and what steps they'll be putting in place to ensure that uh, that cohort make better progress as they move through to key stage two? <coughs> You'll see this in the graph below that one captures the expected level plus one and you'll see that this is a much flatter graph as you'd expect because many of the um, you'd expect a lower number of pupils to achieve and again you can see in the red um, area so highlighted beneath the line those are the schools who are not achieving um, whereas with this regard we're seeing more a greater proportion of our learners um, achieving above the expected level so you can see that quite clearly and I think you know I 
recognise the fact that many of you are um, governors in schools, and uh, I'm sure you've received presentations very similar to this from the EAS, um, but that's the way in which we'll be presenting the information. Um, I'm very conscious, and I'm conscious every year, that there is an awful lot of information around the whole range of indicators. So this year I've extracted that information um, and we've put that at the back of this um, uh, slide deck today. Um, it starts on slide 45 and that's all of the key indicators. So you'll see there the continuation of the foundation phase, uh, moving through key stage two um, and up into key stage three. So we've tried to be as clear as we can um, in that regard as to where uh, the progress of our schools are. And I think actually it's really useful to see the, the performance of our schools um, when compared to similar schools. So, you know, as in a good example, that 10% one on the LLC at outcome five, you can see that that school has performed significantly below our expectation. So I think um, when we begin to develop that language around expectation and performance, I think that's the line of inquiry that uh, that members need to be assured that we're taking with our schools in the future. If I may now, I'll just move on to key stage four uh, and the notion of families of schools. Um, I'd like to talk to you just very briefly about the new measures that were brought in this year. Um, you'll see on the first um, slide that there are um, five measures that are taken as the family of performance measures for key stage four. So this is the end of our compulsory education. They are the CAP 9 point score, um, the literacy point score, the numeracy point score, science point score and Welsh baccalaureate point score. Uh, and those make up a suite of measures that Estin take account of, that Welsh government take account of and that schools are required to complete and return um, in terms of their data sets. In terms of the CAP 9, the table on the right hand side of that slide just captures how that's put together. So you'll see there are nine slots for qualifications and uh, in essence there are three core measures um, that's the literacy the numeracy and the science slots and then there are six other slots which young people can make up with any combination of GCSEs and approved vocational qualifications if I just explain as well one thing the uh, which is the scoring mechanism so um, in terms of the point score uh, an A star is worth 58 points and we then move down through the grades, um, dropping by six points each time. So an A star is worth 58, an A is worth 52 points, a B is worth 46, and critically, the old benchmark of a C grade is worth 40 points. So if someone was to achieve the very best not, uh, CAP 9 score they could, that would be nine um, uh, A stars at 58 points would give them a score of 522. One of the things we're seeing across the nation is that the emergence um, of the fact that um, 400 is a really strong benchmark performance for a CAP 9 score and we're seeing schools really driving to get to that level of performance and 400 is a mixture of B's and C's so that's a really really strong performance and if we can move to a position whereby our average across the authority uh, is at that 400 mark we'll have been making good progress. The next slide really uh, mirrors some of the ones which I've just described to you in that foundation phase, but this time it's for the cap nine at a regional level. And you'll see there that once again, the Monmouthshire schools are, are in amber um, and you'll see the line of regression and best fit across the uh, the region. One caveat I would just like to, to, to make before I describe anything more about this graph is the fact that uh, the performance of the AS region is probably not at the level that the region would want it to be. Um, so if we're taking comfort about how close our schools to being um, on the line or above the line, if we overlaid this with a Welsh line, um, we might be further away again. So I think that's one thing which I just ask you to bear in mind. But you can see there that clearly we have one school um, very clearly above the line, one on the line and two slightly below the line. So those two schools who are below the line are absolutely aware of the fact that they are. Um, I think this exposure to that comparative position of uh, similar schools has really clearly um, led to them wanting to up their great game. I think we've seen significant change in both of those schools in terms of leadership, and I'm expecting both of those schools to perform um, 
Well, I was going to say I expect both of those schools to perform better in the summer, but I think actually um, I'll reflect on that point a little later on because there have been significant changes to this summer's uh, examinations that uh, that is worthwhile updating you about. The next slide picks up the issue of comparing like schools. Um, every school in Wales, um, when the examinations or assessment period is concluded, still receives an all Wales core data set. Um, that will continue into the future for all of the key indicators, those ones which I've just set out at key stage four. Um, the key part of this is to analyse your school's performance against a family um, of schools um, which have very, very key similarities to your own. Um, the similarities are driven uh, or the, the, the family is established by a combination of the percentage of children who are eligible for free school meals, the percentage of pupils who are living in areas identified as being in the lowest 20 or the highest 20 percent deprived areas in Wales, the percentage with special needs and the percentage of those whose first language is not English or Welsh. <coughs> as you would imagine, many of our schools um, are in very, very high performing families and um, the graph on the um, on the slide there, you can see quite clearly that the uh, the schools are identified. Uh, the school itself is is um, is blue. The other schools are indicated as amber and the, the one key one is around uh, the average one, which is the pink um, school. So you can see on the example which I provided to you today that the Monmouthshire school is slightly below the line of regression. Therefore, it hasn't performed as well as the other schools in its family. I guess the key slide for this um, segment really is the next one, um, which is on page 25 of the slide deck, but in your packs um, is on slide is on page um, 187. Um, and you can see that on that slide um, that when we take our schools and compare them to their families and we analyse where they are with regards to the line of their families, that unfortunately um, for all of the measures, um, bar two, we have more schools below the line than we do on or above the line. Um, clearly, this is something that we have to work on. This is the comparison that we need our schools to make, not against the Welsh average, arguably not against the regional average. It's against their progress against the family of schools. And when we see um, our focus for the coming year, you'll see that we've set a much clearer expectation with regards to the progress and outcomes for our learners um, that actually we see our schools above the line of their family comparative groups. Across the board though, we do see real strengths across our system. Um, within the foundation phase, performance at expected level plus one is very good. Our gender gap is lower than the Welsh um, average. Our AFSM gap is lower than the Welsh average. At key stage two, we see that repeated and we see progress at the expected level being better than other comparative authorities. Um, we also see our FSM cohort uh, make the expected progress from their starting point, and that's really important. At key stage three, which has been a focus for us ever since uh, our last inspection back in 2012, um, we have seen strong overall performance at both the expected level plus one and the expected level plus two. And that's a clear indicator um, of success at GCSE when pupils are two levels above the expected performance. We've also seen a closure of the gender gap. We've seen improving FSM performance. Um, and you can see there that um, the FSM gap there is now the same as the Welsh gap, so it, which represents uh, progress for us uh, over past positions. Um, and you can see that we have made pro progress with our EFSM learners in science and English. We recognise there by its exclusion that maths is an area that we need to focus on. At key stage four, we continue to perform well as a whole cohort. But I think it would be remiss of me to even um, suggest that um, FSM performance has uh, improved to the level which we'd be satisfied. We've closed the gap uh, this year so that the gap is now um, much closer to the Welsh gap. Um, however, um, it is not as close um, as we would like it to be uh, and the gap remains too large. Just for, for members, um, the gap last year was 47.1 in the summer of uh, 2018. That gap had closed to 34.1 um, and that was compared to a Welsh position of 31.6.
So we were within 2.5% of the Welsh gap. So that was progress um, for, for Monmouthshire that year. Uh, and of course, as one of the things I say regularly in this um, setting is that we need to ensure that we don't close the gap by our non-FSM um, students performing not as well as we might hope them to as well. So there's always two parts to that equation. <coughs> The next slide sets out quite clearly the areas for development um, and they are, um, I think, quite clearly set out in that uh, slide. I won't go through those line by line, um, but it's around accelerating progress and it's around accelerating the progress of specific groups. That's our key focus. The other two touch points that we use to establish where our system is, um, our categorization, the process by which we determine how much support schools require and um, the ESTIN outcomes that have been achieved. I did mention earlier that we've seen our last uh, group of schools who've been inspected have all achieved um, five goods. I think that's really positive. I think the last one of which was Thornwell in Chepstow. I was really pleased for Tim and the team there in terms of them achieve, achieving that kind of suite of good judgments across the board. Um, and in a categorization sense, we're now in a position whereby nearly 80% of all of our schools are yellow and green. Um, that's in a sense above the, the median and requiring the lowest levels of support. And I'm really pleased to say that we didn't have any red schools uh, in Monmouthshire in 2020. And that's the first time that that's happened in the last six years. And I think that really shows that the whole system is rising. So we're seeing more schools in the green and yellow categories and we're seeing far fewer schools in the red category. And I think that's very positive. Um, I won't talk for very long about attendance. Um, attendance, I'm pleased to say, remains a very clear strength for Monmouthshire um, and we're the highest performing authority at both the primary um, and the secondary level. I do want to just um, take a little bit more time to talk to you about exclusions and you'll see that the data contained within this report um, references 1819. So we have a slightly split reporting line within the Chief Officer's report because of the way that data is collated nationally. So this refers back to um, March 2019 outcomes, um, August 2019 outcomes. Um, next year's report will capture uh, the March year end just gone. Um, primary exclusions are an area of concern. In many regards, the increases that you can see, um, the, the days lost due to fixed term exclusions have been relatively small, um, only moving from 151.5 to 154. But it is an area that head teachers um, are concerned about. It's an area that they do discuss with me very frequently. Um, I'm working with colleagues such as Richard Austin and my colleagues in the um, Additional Learning Needs Service. We're working to try and devise a, a solution that's very clearly focused on the needs of our primary um, colleagues. Um, we're very clear that we don't want to see the introduction of a primary prune. We don't feel that that would be the right solution for Monmouthshire but we do recognise that we do need an enhanced provision for those children to make sure that they uh, receive the support they need to, to achieve what we want them to achieve in their education, because every day uh, on a fixed term exclusion is a day that that child loses to education. So it's an absolutely fundamental part of our role to make sure that we minimise those numbers. We know that our children attend school really well. Um, so the second variable is whether children are excluded and um, we need to move that on. <coughs> secondary exclusions and you'll see there that the numbers um, associated with secondary exclusions um, have increased significantly. Um, we have invested significantly as well to try and mitigate that risk um, and in the last September, September 2019, we saw the introduction um, of new services from our pupil referral service uh, into all four secondary schools to perform, to, to provide an additional um, element of a graduated response for those children who are presenting with challenging behaviour. The early signs of that investment are very promising. Um, we've seen significantly reduced um, exclusions in King Henry VIII um, and we've seen reduced exclusions in Caldicott. Um, the other two schools, we've seen a slight increase in Monmouth and we have seen a more significant increase uh, in Chepstow. We continue to work very, very closely with those head teachers to make sure that our investment is maximised and to make sure it has the impact on learners that we want it to. Um, that investment is set out on the second bullet point of that right hand, um, uh, that right hand kind of column on that slide. Um, it's a significant investment and I'm pleased that we're beginning to see the return on it. 
I'd just like to, to move on now and just to talk about an area which uh, isn't one which is able to be defined in terms of um, uh, quantitative data, but is very much around the qualitative impact. Um, the impact of leadership change. Um, I mentioned the, some of the significant changes we've seen uh, within Monmouthshire, and I think it's been hugely, hugely promising for all of us to see that our head teacher vacancies are very popular when they come out. Um, we are working very closely alongside our governing body, have been very clear about our expectations of our leaders, and our leaders have really responded to that. And as I said earlier, I think the, the group of head teachers that I'm working with at the moment are, I think, the best group of head teachers that I've worked with. And I think uh, the progress and the change we've seen in that area has been really, really positive. And I think at that point at the end of that slide around innovative models of delivery, we're now seeing intra-authority federations. So we're seeing schools working together. So many of you will be aware of the work between Clan Foist and Clan Bianca Corny. We're seeing an emerging partnership uh, between Kim in View and Clan Dogo School. And of course, um, we've got the relationship between Caldicott Secondary School and the Bishop of Landaff. And more recently, the head teacher in King Henry VIII School has become the executive head teacher um, of Kreuzer Kolyog um, Secondary School in um, Torvine. So we're beginning to see both within the authority and across boundaries, innovative ways of delivering leadership, which impact on the learners uh, within those schools. <coughs> I won't uh, dwell very long on the safeguarding um, aspects. Suffice to say that um, we've worked really, really hard. I was so pleased to see it recognised within the Estin report. It's absolutely fundamental that we know our children are safe in school. Um, the work that Heather Heaney has done with our school leaders has been exemplary, and I was so pleased to see that recognised uh, in the Estin report. And the slide in the in the report this year just kind of seeks to give you a level of assurance about the way that that works around the way that the whole authority safeguarding group that's chaired by uh, Julie Boothroyd, our, um, our director of social services, is really kind of making sure that the, the rigour and the investment that we spend in children, young peoples is echoed right across the organisation. And I think we're beginning to see huge dividends in that, uh, in that piece. <coughs> I'll, um, I'll come to discuss the, the finances now. And um, you'll see on this slide that um, finances clearly um, represent a challenge um, for schools at the moment. I think it would be, you know, if I was to try and say anything else, then uh, they, I think the numbers would immediately contradict that. Um, but you will see that the performance um, compared to our month 10 projections has been markedly improved, both in terms of the school deficit position and in terms of our corporate finance. Um, we will see the uh, the emergence of the full year end report uh, shortly and the detail will be contained within that. But I'm very pleased to see the school deficit position uh, reduced from that predicted level of 879 to 435,000. Um, I think that's shown real progress and dedication and commitment on the part of head teachers. Um, but I also recognise the concerns that will exist in the chamber that there is still a deficit figure uh, in that number. Um, with regards to the corporate finance, you'll see that our month 10 forecast was nearly a million pounds overspent and we have brought that back to just a little under 480,000. Uh, that's principally with um, regard to some grant management that we've managed within the authority, um, but also making sure that uh, we're as accurate and as um, commissioned our um, external um, packages of care and support for children and young people um, as closely and as accurately as we can do and we've seen improvement in that area. So before I conclude I just want to um, talk very briefly about some of the emerging risks for education and for children and young people. Um, the first slide of this relates to um, the COVID-19 situation. Um, clearly and uh, I know Councillor Grokert's questions uh, to, for today for Council reflect some of the um, findings that have been seen in England by both the Education Endowment Foundation and the uh, Department for Education and Skills, um, that it's likely that this significant gap in face-to-face -face learning and teaching will have an impact um, on learners' progress. And that will be for all learners, but the risk is clearly that that will be um, uh, a gap that is uh, more significant for some of our more disadvantaged group. So we're aware of that, but we're doing all we can to support those groups, and that's absolutely critical. 
I did mention earlier on that I just wanted to talk around the examination system. Clearly, um, I'm sure you're all aware that there will be no formal external examinations this year um, and that uh, the examination process will be around um, schools undertaking centre assessed grades. Um, so schools have been working really hard to make sure that they have the evidence to su submit to um, the examination board um, to state quite clearly what they think each individual child will achieve um, this summer. It's likely to be very contentious. Um, there is going to be a significant um, amount of statistical measurement. There'll be a statistical model that's applied by the examination board and we are likely to see some children um, very, very clear um, that they might not have achieved what they hoped they would achieve. So let's just, um, I think, walk towards the summer outcomes um, with a kind of a guarded level of expectations. The final piece I just want to touch on, um, I would just draw your attention to the slide which talks about the next period. Clearly, I've talked about the rates of progress that our different groups made, making sure that our provision is fit for the future, making sure that we're providing our schools with the necessary support to meet the needs of future generations and critically to go on and deliver education. Um, excellence to all of our learners. I'm sure that I've spoken for far too long this afternoon, um, despite not using the slides. So I'll, I'll hold there and if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you, Mr McLean, for that very detailed and informative report. Uh, we have eight members who have indicated they would like to ask you some questions or nine now. So we'll take the first two first. We'll take uh, Councillor Tudor Thomas, followed by Councillor Armand Watts. Tudor Thomas, would you like to uh, ask your question, please? Yeah, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, uh, Will, for that very um, detailed report. A um, couple of things, really. Um, first one is, is the sort of perennial problem of um, free school meal performance. Uh, and particularly at uh, key stage four. It does concern me now and this is, is not the authorities fault or, or, or in a sense school's fault, but with children having been out of school uh, for 10 or 11 weeks, it undoubtedly, uh, and I think Councillor Groker's question will reflect this, but free school meal pupils will probably slip more than people pupils in more um, affluent backgrounds. So I just wonder what, you know, one question I've got is, is there a definite sort of strategy to try and tackle that and particularly in terms of what's happened with COVID? The other thing I point I want to make is there is still this gap um, between, you know, foundation phase and key stage two where children tend to do well and then at the crucial stage in key stage four in terms of external exams, um, they have slipped back, you know, it, it, it's it's the worst one in a sense from, from over the previous two years. Again, will there be a strategy with with the authority and and with the AS? We pay substantial amounts of money to AS and really, you know, we want to see something happening there in terms of that uh, gap. And the third thing is the fixed terms exclusion without going into the big detail of it. Um, but you look, you know, primary has gone up secondary has gone up 57 uh, percent. Um, that is a concern both for the pupils who are, are excluded, but it, it's it's a bad sort of warning sign for uh, children who are in that class or in that group uh, within the school. If you've got that sort of level of disruption that you've got to move to a fixed term exclusion, um, there's probably been a build up to that. It doesn't just happen overnight. And my concern is about the child who's excluded, but also the other children in the class. And, and if you put yourself in, in, in the place of a, a person teaching in a classroom, you're trying to teach 28 youngsters and you might have possibly a very disruptive uh, child there. And obviously we've got less um, teacher assistance in classrooms now. And I, I wonder if, if that is, is having an effect. And finally, um, you know, the issue of finance. And if you look at the figures again, without going into details, but you know, you've got uh, practically all the secondaries are in deficit, the 13 primaries. The only way you can address that is through staffing. And in reality, if you've got less staff in the classroom uh, or in the lab or, or workshop, then if you have got children with challenging behaviours, it's, it's more difficult. 
uh, for the teachers and for the TAs left in, in that classroom. So, you know, it's really free school meals, phase two, foundation phase through to, to key stage four. You know, why is there such a, a, a drop? Fixed term exclusions and, and finance. And, and, and in reality, we should be seeing for children at the top end as well, we should be challenging those more. And if, if I were a parent in school now, or with kids in school now, with, with, with an able girl or boy there, I would want to see them achieving the absolute best. I, I, I want to see them just sort of bumping along. So I, a couple of concerns there. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Watts, would you like to ask your questions? Yes. Yes, Chair. Thank you. It kind of dovetails in um, with what my colleagues said there. I mean, 80% of running costs, I, I believe, I think it's still the percentage, um, are, are based on staff, really. Um, and I worry about this because obviously the deficit clearly has gone up. We've gone from having what it says here, 15 schools, um, three secondary, 12 primary to 18 schools this year. Now, I, I did a quick calculation on my calculator. That's 54% of the schools in Monmouthshire that are running deficit. That means that half over half of us head teachers, half of the schools are being asked to run a school with not enough money. Uh, I, I've never in the history of, of me being on this authority ever come, up, come across a stat where we've had over 50% of our schools in deficit. And there's clearly something very wrong, and I think you've downplayed it, Will. I really do. Um, if, if, if that is not a risk or a potential risk, I don't know what is. Now, I want to know what you're going to do about it. Where are you going to find this money? Are you going to go to the cabinet member and say, look, come on, let's be absolutely fair about it. We can't continue in this way. We can't keep running deficit budgets. Every year it goes up. And let's be honest with each other. You know, with this, with COVID-19, we all know that austerity is going to get worse. The situation, families' incomes are going to get worse. People are going to be poorer and, and children are going to be more vulnerable. So you need to really think about investing more time, effort and money into protecting our schools because this is completely unacceptable. Uh, one final question, um, Chepstow School. How many exclusions have there been at Chepstow School? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So would you like to take some more questions? Well, or, should we or would you like to answer those now? I think if I could answer those two, because there's quite a lot right. of ground to cover on both yeah. of those. Right. Okay. Um, I'll try to be far briefer in my answering of questions. Um, I think um, with regards to Councillor Thomas's questions, absolutely. Um, we had the emergence of a, a FSM strategy um, early part of this year, um, which I think uh, began a good process. Um, I think at that point in time, it needed to be more nuanced. It needed to reflect the different challenges in different types of schools. For instance, if we think about Derry View School in Abergavenny, which has circa 40% um, FSM learners, and then Shire Newton down near Chepstow, which can have sometimes no FSM learners in a cohort, then actually, you know, your solutions and your approaches will be very different in those schools. So I think actually, yes, you know, we clearly have to do more work on that um, uh, that strategy. And that's clearly one of the recommendations that Eston have made. Um, I think the impact of COVID will be significant. And I think the the, the repair work um, that we need to do with some of those vulnerable learners will be significant because the time away from face to face, the learning how to learn, the support, the well-being and so on, um, however hard our schools have worked, and they have worked unbelievably hard to do that. Um, it is still not going to be the same as seeing those children having eyes on and being able to support them. So hopefully the return to school measures that the minister announced yesterday will allow us to begin that process prior to the summer. But we have got to recognise the impact of such an extended period of time away from school. Um, I completely concur with um, Councillor Thomas's and um, Councillor Watts comments around fixed term exclusions. They are too high. That's why we've invested um, additional support in our schools to try and reduce them. We will continue that investment into primary schools in the next phase. Um, it's a it's a, a systematic approach that's going to have to be retired um, applied. It's going to have to be one which is holistic and goes right from classroom management all the way to those children who need the more significant interventions in the future. Um, and yes, it can have a significant influence on other children and young people learning in that environment. I think one of the things, particularly in the primary stage, is that we see very 
significant elements of the total are made up by a very few um, children. And uh, we've seen that uh, moving certain children in managed moves between schools really impacts positively on that. And different approaches in different schools has a very, very positive impact. Um, the finances, um, <coughs> I I'm, uh, apologise if members felt that I um, underplayed that position. I clearly recognised it was a risk. Um, I think clearly this year we've um, taken forward the, uh, the the new recommendation that we are able to make loans to school. I know that uh, not everybody agrees with that as being the, the right way forward, um, but it does allow our schools to manage that deficit in a in a longer term way. It gives them the ability to spread that. And from the engagement we've had with schools, they have responded really positively to that offer. And I think that's um, something that we will use to, to make sure that the recovery is smooth and that it doesn't have an impact on those children, young people learning within the schools. Um, I, I, I think Councillor Watts was in some way questioning the time and the effort that we put into ensuring that our schools are effective. I'd refute that at every level because I think everybody working in the system works tirelessly to make sure their children achieve the very best they can. I think we know the challenges that the authority faces with regards to its budget and we'll continue to to make sure that we make the best case we can for schools to be funded at the best rate that they're able to be. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Right, we'll now move on to, we have Councillor Petruni and Councillor Grokar. If we could take your questions next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, thanks, Will, for uh, that comprehensive report. Um, and I'm gonna start off being positive. I know it's a shock for everyone, but um, the safeguarding is a fantastic result. And bear in mind where we were in 2012, um, I think uh, across the piece, we should be really, really proud of that and proud of you and the staff who delivered that. Um, and I also want to pay tribute to you and all the staff on the hubs um, and the comprehensive data you've been giving me on that. Um, it was you did the best in a terrible situation and, and, and I pay tribute to you and all the staff who did such an amazing work. Uh, on the report itself, um, one technical question first, if I may, Chair. Um, the, the regression line, um, which I love, you know, because I'm a geek, but um, I, I love that kind of regression line beginning uh, and across family, uh, family of schools and understanding where we s sit within there. Are we using that kind of technique regarding correlations around certain schools and what might be factors influencing, for example, poor performance at free school meal level. Do you know what I mean? A kind of more granular kind of regression analysis around understanding the causes. Um, I just wanted your views on that. So that's a more technical question. On the more negative side, I'm sorry, Will, um, is around the recommendations. And my question's on this. As you state in the report, it's the fourth report in, and um, we're still talking about, um, you know, <laughs> free school meals and performance. I, I appreciate it, it improved this um, academic year, but it's still the, the, the second worst in four years. So, you know, great improving, but uh, I want to kind of, I know you've given Estin, a, I, I believe you've given Estin a kind of strategy to um, address this in more detail. When will council see that? First question. Second question, um, uh, articulate a clear strategy for SEM provision. This is my second term and, I, and I've been hearing through Grapevine how many SEM uh, strategies will be coming due, will be coming soon to us and it never sort of materialises. And we're you know, four years in now, where is it? Where are we with it? It's really important because we need to strengthen our improvement planning. Um, on uh, areas of um, finance, and I know, I, 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 I know the discussion around this, but I don't know what work you've done on this, but I've been knocking around some of the data and individual school budgets. If we had kept up with inflation, just inflation now, so we weren't actually, uh, so it's all neutral, we weren't increasing it more than that, just inflation, we'd be giving schools, uh, total school budget, sorry, 63 million. When I last checked on Stats Wales, we're giving them 54 million pounds. So, Shy, just shy of 10 million pounds short where if we had just kept with inflation now building on our uh, councillor watson tudor thomas's point that's a hell of a drop will 
and we need to have a serious conversation about and I, I've got to be honest I have concerns about the loan so you know let's at least fund it by inflation I don't know I want to kind of give your views on that and lastly which I suppose is linked to finance it's full-time equivalents um, you're given the total school number in your report uh, which I believe is over a thousand but if you break that down by teacher nine years ago just full-time equivalent teachers now we had 636.6 now we have 576 so over nine years we've hemorrhaged teachers um and i wonder your views on that thank you ever so much i'll, I'll like come to, sorry sorry well my <laughs> microphone was muted can i can we ask invite councillor grocott to just bring his questions forward now please Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, two two points really, Will, I think, uh, related to points that you raised uh, in your very comprehensive report there, and, and thanks for that. Uh, one is around this area of um, schools liaison, liaising with each other for, for mutual support uh, and so on. Uh, within my own ward, I've got two schools that are going to be affected by the 21st century school developments uh, on, on the new site in Abergavenny, King Henry and Derry View, uh, to create what I hope will be an incredibly successful 3 to 19 school. Now, um, that won't be too long in the beginning of its development now, I hope. Uh, and it will be fantastic to see that actually up and running. I am concerned that at the moment there has been no planning, certainly between the governing bodies. Uh, and, and I know that the the head teacher at King Henry and the governors at King Henry are anxious at the lack of current liaison with the authority and with Derry View to get plans in place before the school is there. So the school reflects our needs rather than the schools and the staff trying to fit in with something that's already been built. And I hope we don't get that the wrong way around. The second area uh, I'd just like your views on really, uh, it, it's coming back to fixed term exclusions, but coming at it from a slightly different angle, I think. Um, it relates directly to Councillor Petruni's motion that we're going to come to fairly shortly now. Uh, and I think that where you have the sort of challenging behaviour that often underlies fixed term uh, exclusions, there are very clear links between social deprivation, poverty, challenging communities uh, 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 and schools see that uh, in the behaviour of a small minority of children. Um, and, and it's very easy to see these problems in silos. So a social worker will go and work with the parents. The school will work with the children. And, and actually, that means that we're not seeing the totality of the problem. Um, behind every fixed term excluded child, there is a fixed term excluded family. Uh, and, and I worry that in the months ahead, we will see the economy in a state of collapse uh, and the, the, the climb back from that being quite slow. We've already seen, uh, as I think, a direct one of the direct impacts of the austerity programme of the government, the rise in fixed term exclusions and the rise in challenging behaviour in schools. I think and I fear that that will will get worse as the economy falls off a cliff. And I think there is so much evidence now that it is likely to do that. Um, I hope that you will be working quite closely with other senior colleagues across the, the the senior leadership of the authority to try to address this rather than looking at it a problem for schools and classroom teachers thanks thank you mr mcclain would you like to respond to those questions yeah of course thank you um 
and uh, starting with Councillor Petrunis, um, I think firstly to say, you know, I would entirely um, echo your comments around the, the safeguarding pit. I think that is something which we should be really proud of in terms of the progress. And uh, I would, uh, from my perspective, extend my thanks to all my colleagues, both within CYP and the schools um, themselves who stood up that hub provision um, in days ready for us to be uh, there to start on the 23rd of March and have um, worked across holidays, across weeks, sometimes weekends uh, to put that uh, provision in place for those key worker and vulnerable children. So I uh, would uh, extend my thanks with regards to that. Um, in terms of uh, the future, the piece, I think um, in terms of where we are now, in terms of what colleagues are currently working on, I think it's uh, I think it would be fair to say that the uh, that both of those documents um, uh, will be brought in front of um, key committees uh, in the autumn of this year. I'm very, very keen to make sure that they are um, concluded um, and in place um, and that they are cognizant both of the longer term um, but also the uh, the medium and shorter term, which is, you know, how do we support <coughs> some of those key learners um, at this moment when a blended learning offer um, i.e. both virtual um, from home and present in schools will be with us for a significant period of time. So um, yes, absolutely, uh, both of those will be back uh, within the um, in front of both CYP Select um, and we we'll welcome that scrutiny and that challenge um, and that's very constructive uh, in the autumn um, and certainly then through into full council when necessary as they're part of the um, broader piece around the authorities policy framework. Um, with regard to the, the the financing, I mean, I I'm acutely aware that uh, finances and the budget is a matter uh, for the for the political body um, of Monmouthshire County Council, and uh, so I'll be careful in terms of um, my contribution in terms of that. I think the one thing I would say in terms of um, in the past few years, we have funded teachers' pay awards. Um, the biggest driver for costs in schools is teachers' pay awards. It was the significant increase in terms of the pension. Um, and those have been funded um, to schools fully. Um, so I think that would be my observation that I made there. Um, but clearly, you know, the, um, there continues to be pressure, inflationary pressure right across the organisation, and we need to manage our resources as best we can. The reduction in teachers and in terms of teaching assistance, um, I think we've moved to a model which is, um, you know, clearly always um, meets our kind of standard uh, ratios and so on. Some schools, um, find themselves in challenging years when they have kind of slightly larger or slightly smaller cohorts. That's when we really see pressure um, brought on. Um, we've committed to really reviewing the number of primary schools that we have in the future um, to make sure that they're in the right place and are sized correctly. I think that's going to be really important. So uh, I, says, I hope those comments address your points, Councillor Petruni. Um, with regard to Councillor Grocutts, um, absolutely on your first point around the future of the Abergavenny provision, absolutely. We're in that stage at the moment, which is just slightly ahead of the uh, the real engagement about what um, the, the future of that education will look like. So we're still working through the technical pieces around the, um, the submissions to Welsh Government, um, the, the project management being appropriately procured and so on. Um, but absolutely all council has my complete commitment that we will engage fully with go with both governing bodies if this is going to be a success we really need to reimagine education through a through school methodology and that is different to both the primary school methodology and a secondary school methodology the pedagogy will change there'll be different impacts the way we can work will be different and i think that links actually to your second point councillor groker as well because i think one of the things which we have to recognize is that within Monmouthshire, and this has been a point I think I've been aware of and have made ever since I started here, is that the deprivation um, focuses in some areas and some schools are specifically kind of impacted upon it. But we do need to take this broader, um, almost kind of societal view about how we manage um, to support families, to support schools, to support that whole area. Um, and I think you know some of the work we're seeing around the community focused schools, some of that work, I think is a good indication of the way we might go in the future for other areas. I think that's something that we can build and think about in terms of our FSM strategy, but I completely concur and agree that, uh, that we have to take that broader look and it's not simply something for a school to fix. I think if we get to that position, then our solutions will be um, narrow and ineffective in the longer term and won't actually remedy the, the wrongs that we're trying to right. 
<coughs> Can I invite Councillor Harris, uh, followed by Councillor Taylor, to speak next, please? Thank you, um, Madam Chair. My point is also on uh, fixed term exclusions, and obviously uh, we've really uh, hammered uh, this point all the way down the line. And we can see from Will's excellent <coughs> report, thank you, uh, Will, uh, there's three primary schools with the um, amounted to 30 or 40 percent of the fixed term mm. exclusions, and it's been inferred that um, deprivation <coughs> has got a lot to do with it. But I wonder if we're drilling down even further than uh, than that uh, to see if it if it's other than dep uh, depredation that is causing the um, uh, the the problems and it would be good to know um, especially councillors where these schools are, whose wards these schools are in to be able to um, be part of if you like trying to uh, solve the uh, the problem if we know what the problems are if we've looked at all possible reasons um, for these fixed term exclusions we're in a much better position to do something about uh, curing it so uh, exactly how much detail goes into really analyzing why these few schools produce the the, um, uh, the maximum amount of fixed term exclusions and I just wonder how much work you've done on that Will. Can I invite Councillor Taylor to speak now please? Good afternoon Chair. Um, Thank you for the report, Will. Um, so I have um, two uh, primary questions. One of them, like some of my colleagues, does relate to the fixed term exclusions, but I noted particularly that our rate of fixed term exclusions has um, effectively, um, well, almost tripled, if you like, since 2012. Um, we're clearly talking about certain measures in which, you know, outcomes for children have improved. Um, however, I, I note that, uh, you know, you've made reference to, for example, um, some of the changes that have that have occurred in secondary school to manage um, behaviour to avoid fixed term exclusions. However, um, it just seems to me that whatever we are doing, and I, I, you, again, you noted uh, managed moves between schools, is uh, and different approaches that schools are taken is not really uh, would not seem to be a particularly effective um, solution at the present time so I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that and also um, in terms of this matter of reducing variance and um, increasing consistency across across schools in terms of outcome um, as you say that uh, you know there are 30 primaries and four secondaries but that does seem to be still a significant issue now the figures that you have in this report relate to 2018-19 but Estin who visited in 2020 also particularly note this issue of fixed term exclusions so I wonder what we are changing about our approach and the second question really is the one around family of schools um, Again, like some of my colleagues, I can recall discussing this issue of our performance. So if we look at our, you know, how the how family of schools are, are set, we've had, you know, quite a significant variance in, in, in some uh, some of those, in particular at secondary from schools with similar demographics, etc. Um, and uh, I, I think that the, the, the detail that you've provided and um, that uh, regression chart shows that quite um, quite starkly, um, and I just again, you know, I wonder 
almost why it has taken us quite so long to to really focus on on the difference between our performance and similar schools with similar demographics. Thank you. Mr. McLean, would you like to respond? Thank you, um, Chair. Yes, of course. Um, with regards to um, Councillor Harris's question about what do we do to understand the analysis of the fixed term exclusions, um, very significant work goes into that um, so that we understand which schools, um, what's driving that, um, where are the key pressures. And uh, my colleague uh, Richard Austin has um, recently completed a very, very significant piece of analysis looking back over that period of time um, over the last, I think, four years to us to help us understand what drives that. Um, I think what we have seen, and uh, Councillor Harris rightly drew out the um, that detail about three schools. Uh, interestingly, certainly two of those schools are not schools which I would identify as being our um, schools where there is uh, significant deprivation. Sometimes the management of children and their approaches um, children's needs um, are different between schools and I have actually seen children move who have had very very high levels of fixed term exclusions in one school um, to another um, whereby they are practically non-existent so we need to find the very very best ways of working with our teachers and our school leaders to make sure that our um, they're able to respond really effectively and appropriately to all of our learners needs because more often than not what drives behavior um, is actually children maybe dis being disengaged maybe not um, engaging with the learning in the work in their in their class and so on so there can be a whole range of things so one of the things which we're absolutely committed to do and again bringing that through cyp select is to make sure that um, that very clear analysis um, and understanding of that data is shared with members um, and we will be clear about where it's an issue, what type of school and so on, even if we don't name the school specifically. Um, with regard to um, Councillor Taylor's questions, um, I think that um, where we see effective partnership work between the pupil referral service and the school, we have seen the initial um, investment that we have made make a significant difference. Um, and we've seen that over the, the past period um, that effective management by both the school and through Gareth Morgan, who's our head of our um, pupil referral service, we've seen great strides there and that has minimised the level of fixed term exclusions in some of our schools. Um, and I'm really pleased to see that. And I think what we need to do now is to make sure that that partnership approach um, is seen um, right across the board so the lessons about close partnership working are taken um, across all of our schools now some schools have different approaches so for instance and uh, not naming the schools but you know i've got one or we have one head teacher who might be very tempted to use a kind of uh, a sharp kind of uh, fixed term exclusion um, for uh, you know an initial episode of uh, behavior that doesn't fall within the acceptable parameters um, another head teacher would say actually a fixed term exclusion doesn't gain me anything, it doesn't gain the child anything. So actually I'm going to keep them um, back after school and they're going to do something around the school that benefits the school, whether that's cleaning tables or whatever else. So different approaches to it have different um, different outcomes. So it, lots of it is cultural. So to try and impose a top down model of behaviour management, um, I think would be met with um, quite kind of severe resistance by the, the head teachers. But what we have to do and what we always have to do is um, the children and people's function is to make sure that no child is adversely impacted by a fixed term exclusion. No child has one which is um, applied unfairly or isn't on grounds which warrant it. And that's what we'll continue to do with regards to that. With regard to your um, point around the uh, family of schools, um, the family of schools has always been our comparative piece. Um, and it's one, one of the ones which has really led to us challenging our schools to be much better than they have been in the past. Um, families of schools see our schools compared to the very best schools in Wales um, and it's clearly our expectation that our schools perform at that level too and I don't think that has changed from the first day of uh, my time in this role uh, to now. I think we've got to be very clear that um, if other schools are achieving um, outcomes um, in terms of the old measures in excess of um, 80 percent then absolutely it's our expectation that our schools achieve that. How they do it 
um, is about bringing new practice, about bringing new challenge um, into the system. And as I mentioned, that's the importance in terms of that change in leadership. Um, we've seen recently, um, I, I still count Elspeth, uh, Mrs. Lewis in uh, um, King Henry as a relatively new head teacher and the uh, kind of the dynamism, the new ideas that we're seeing from Elspeth, from uh, Mark in Caldicott, uh, from Matt in um, Chepstow are all beginning to have an impact in terms of the outcomes of those schools. The other thing is, is that we've been really successful in working with the AS to broker additional support from outside of the region. So we're no longer um, at the risk of looking kind of inwardly for solutions. Um, so, for instance, Chepstow School has um, the Cardiff High School teacher, uh, head teacher as their challenge advisor and the support comes from Cardiff High School. And that's really, really, you know, Cardiff High School, for those of you who are not aware, is one of the very strongest performing schools in Wales. Um, in the same way, Caldicott has support from uh, an outstanding head teacher at Eastern High in Cardiff. So we've gone beyond our boundary. We've gone beyond the boundary of the region to find the very best practitioners in Wales to come and support our schools to improve. And that's the way in which we'll um, make those strides that we all want to see through um, really excellent leadership across the school that drives that improvement and us making sure that we never shy away from having the very highest expectations. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Can I invite <coughs> Councillor Fox, followed by Councillor Powell, to speak, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members. I won't speak too long because I'm conscious of the time and the fair list there as well. Uh, Will, you must be getting worn out. And um, thank you. First of all, thank you for the report. Again, it's a, a, a really concise, honest and clear report. And uh, we thank you for that. It really makes our our job uh, easy to, um, to 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 follow the situation, but also for colleagues to challenge where it's legitimate to uh, challenge. Can I, though, first of all, uh, just um, share the thanks to, to you and our whole Monmouthshire team for what you've done and still doing through the crisis. And uh, we've had new, uh, new guidance yesterday, which is going to require a mega amount of work over coming weeks, but I know you and the team and our, our, our practitioners will raise a challenge and, and put that in place. Um, can, I, can I also just, just briefly uh, echo your thanks to the likes of Heather Heaney and the safeguarding um, uh, side of things within the Estim report and the recognition of the work with the EAS and, and can I also, through your report, recognise the progress we're making on the finance? I know I've, I've heard some you know, opposition's uh, role to challenge and, and uh, they've done that constructively in the main. And uh, we recognise there are still challenges in the report. There's always been challenges and sadly I, I struggle with it as well as we all do about the, 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 the eligible free school meals performance, but we're making ground slowly. I'm really anxious about what this current crisis in this year is going to do uh, and it's going to skew things and it's going to be the same uh, right away across the, 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 the country, even the world. And uh, we've got to, you know, deal with that as it crops up. Um, but uh, but there has been, um, uh, uh, you know, sig significant progress made. We have some of the best performing schools in Wales, but we do have more to do and we recognise that. But, um, you know, colleagues uh, 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 talk about the, the funding side of things and, uh, you know, we and, and I thank you, uh, Will, for refuting what uh, Councillor Watts said. Uh, around uh, around his criticism uh, of the service and uh, and delivering and uh, because that is not the case and I'd invite Armand and Watts to get a lot closer to the organisation for us to help him understand the position uh, a lot better. Um, but I, and I but I, I, I welcome Dimitri's uh, uh, a challenge as well and Mar Martin's uh, constructive uh, points. But funding is really is you know it's really challenging our commitment to funding education has been solid in Monmouthshire and continuous and it always has ever since I joined the council doesn't matter which party was in place we've always done the best we can with the resources we've got and we must never forget you know where the resources come to uh, from us and we've also got to ask ourselves if you want another 10 million Dimitri thrown into education which I would love to do tell me where we take 10 million from which services are you willing to axe and uh, all of those other things you know so it, you can't raise one thing in 
in, in on its own without looking at the wider picture. And that's when it comes to an administration, we have to look at the whole picture and we do the very best we can with the limited and the minuscule resources we get given from Wales government. So, Madam Chairman, I, I don't need to go on more than that, but uh, only to recognise the quality of the report, the quality of Will's leadership and the quality of the team we have right away through, through the, the organisation. And a big thank you also to our Cabinet member, Richard John, for the part he's played in, in working alongside Will in driving the positive change we have coming forward. One of the things which was touched on briefly was about uh, uh, the new school in Abergavenny. And uh, what I can share is that ministers, I, I did uh, ask, were we um, confident that 21st century schools funding would be secured for these sorts of projects? And ministers, uh, even in the light of what we're in at the moment, uh, shared that that money would be secure. So I took some confidence to that, that we can make progress on our uh, 21st century schools programme. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Powell, would you like to, can I invite you to speak now? Yes, thank you. Can you see me, hear me? Yeah, fine. Thank you very much, Will, for your report. Uh, very extensive and, and very good. Um, I won't stop on it long, but there's one thing about exclusions, which I just like to say is so often the public look at the number of exclusions and assume it's that number of pupils. And you've got to remember very often it's not many pupils, it's just the same ones excluding. And the other thing is you can have families where some of the children are, are really good going to school and they behave themselves and just one who isn't and one who hit does get excluded. So it's not necessarily their home life or where they live, it's people are all different. And I think we need to realise that. But what I really wanted to say, and this is about uh, the teachers, um, they do they do such a wonderful job, but they're cut so thin at the moment because of the um, finances. And I think it's sad that sometimes uh, it's all right if they're all fit and well, but when we lose one, we are in trouble. And I think, you know, if they have to be off for any length of time, I think that we must remember that that is the source of the education of all our children. And it's an old fashioned saying that says, it's a pity to spoil the job for a hapeth of tar. And I don't know how many other people remember that one, but it is that if we cut back too much, I know we've got a very little money to use, but we mustn't cut back too much on our teachers. Otherwise we will suffer. I don't know what, um, uh, that was my question really to, to um, Will, was what he thinks about um, sub, you know, keeping our teachers going. Thank you. Shall we move on and take Councillor Watkins' questions as well? I invite Councillor Watkins, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so firstly, Will, thank you very much for the report. It seems a, an, an almost lifetime ago that you actually brought that to CYP Select before the crisis. So um, um, I gave it quite a lot of scrutiny at that point, so you'll be spared most of this then. Um, in terms of you mentioning the fact that the south of the county is waiting for a consultation on the growth for schools, please let's push forwards and try and get some movement on that. The schools in the south of the county are full and that is going to make it even harder to manage in the upcoming um, changes that we're going to have when we're going to have to have reduced numbers of children in our schools. So we really, really do need to address the lack of school places in, in the south of the county and the work that needs to be done for that. Um, also, in terms of the additional needs support, I know that in terms of the way the crisis has been handled, the virus crisis, um, children who've had statements have had a lot of support um, and that's been fantastic. Um, I would also like to point out there's quite a lot of children in our school system who don't have a statement of educational needs, but they do need a lot of support and probably those families are going to be having find it hard to homeschool. So can we please make sure that whatever we're doing going forwards actually looks at those children and their situations as well. Um, and in terms of your reference to the SEN strategy that we've been waiting for for a while and we've seen various iterations of it really does need to look at the, how the idea of blended schooling going forwards in the short term is addressed because families do find it a lot harder to address homeschooling for children with additional needs. It's not the same. You, you can't actually deal with it in exactly the same way. Um, and then the last one really is, in, is relating to finance. Um, our schools may not be able to get their full complement of staff back due to shielding. 
could you give reassurance to parents that there will be enough staff there that the schools won't have to worry about their budgets in terms of getting um, support staff in, of getting supply agency work staff in, in order to make sure that we've got the full complement. Because I know that with budgets being very tight for schools, then employing a lot of extra supply staff might be a, an actual query that they would have to raise. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to respond to those, Will? Of course. Thank you, Chair. Um, I thank you, Councillor Fox, for your comments and the clarity around the 21st century schools funding. I think that's uh, allows us really to push ahead now, and I'm really very pleased that Welsh Government have uh, uh, protected that investment. Um, with regard to Councillor Powell's um, uh, question, uh, teachers are, are fundamental. Um, you know, I think much research has been done, and I think that relationship with the the, the key um, teacher, the key individual in that classroom is the fundamental piece that allows um, a child to, to really flourish. And I think that um, uh, we will continue to invest. Um, one of the things which uh, I potentially should have mentioned uh, uh, when I was talking about leadership is just how pleased I am to see the uh, heightened levels of uptake by Monmouthshire schools and by Monmouthshire professionals in terms of some of the learning offers that exist from the AS in terms of early career development, in terms of middle leaders, and in terms of our, our head teachers now seeking to become um, executive head teachers. So we're seeing right across our, our whole teaching function, more and more uh, people looking for those opportunities, looking to be uh, led by research, looking for them to really understand what makes the impact. And I think that's a, that's a hugely positive suggestion and situation for us. With regard to Councillor Watkins's questions, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, the hope quite clearly is that um, that we will see in the coming period um, a change to the regulation, which means that school change consultations um, are just done on normal working days as, oppo as opposed to um, uh, school days. And that will allow us to, to start those consultations, which I know are very much needed in the south of the county. Um, and yes, I completely recognise your two points around uh, the provision for ALN in that blended learning environment. Um, and that's something which um, my colleagues uh, in the educational psychology team have been uh, providing some additional resources and so on to, to help people at home with that at, um, with that uh, learning experience. But it is something that is going to be with us for a little while. So we will need to think about how we give that additional support, because for many of our learners who do have additional learning needs, um, there is a relationship with other members of staff in school. So we need to think of a way in which we can um, support them. Um, clearly, the announcement yesterday um, recognises and expects, I think, that more vulnerable learners um, are in school in the future. So for that, um, those last four weeks of the extended summer term, um, I think we'll be working very hard with our head teachers to make sure that everybody's seen that that well-being and understanding how people are working with the um, the, the new blended learning um, is really there. And that those key elements, the check in, catch up and prepare, the prepare is going to be as important as the other two elements. Um, and just with regards to the final point, um, I'm really um, pleased that um, our, our HR colleagues, our heads have been really working well together. We've got a really good sense about the workforce, where they are, how many are um, shielded, how many are able to work, how many are able to work, but not necessarily be uh, in a school building. And we'll be working very closely with our schools in the coming weeks now to make sure that everybody has the necessary staff uh, to welcome their children back on the 29th of June. Thank you. And we're going the last um, member wishing to speak is Councillor John. So I'm going to invite Councillor John in now for the last question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, can I, can I start by thanking Mr McLean for um, what I think is a very balanced and accessible report. Um, I also want to thank um, officers, teachers, um, all our, our school based staff, as well as school governors for everything they've done, not just in the past year, the, the period covered by this report, but particularly in the last few months um, where the challenges have been particularly significant and, and the way um, in, in, in which the hubs were set up and have run is really impressive. I, I visited um, Raglan Hub um, a few days ago with the uh, with the Wales Office Minister David Davis and it was really impressive the the, the way those um, hubs are being run and it's it's a fantastic facility for um, children enabling key workers to um, continuing 
to continue doing their really important work. Um, obviously, one of the, the major landmark in the last 12 months was our Estin inspection in February, the first full inspection we've had since uh, November 2012. Um, and it really highlights our school improvement journey in, in recent years. It recognised the priority of offering children and young people the very best start in life. It sets out a number of areas of strength, including our partnership working with our, our school improvement partners, the uh, EAS. Um, good pupil progress, a clear vision, best practice in terms of safeguarding, strong standards of well-being, valuable strategies to support vulnerable pupils, strong attendance, strong participation rates in our extra, uh, extracurricular activities, including the Duke of Edinburgh Award, which has got the highest participation rate in the country. Um, we were pleased to see um, attendance rates continuing to compare very favourably with with um, other councils. Um, the report also highlighted recommendations for, for future progress, including in areas of existing priority for us, um, particularly in terms of free school meals, outcomes, special educational needs, continuing our drive to raise standards and self-evaluation processes. Um, and those are obviously being recognised in, um, in our updating of, of the corporate plan. The Chief Officer Report um, highlights other areas of, of strength in terms of pupil outcomes at all key stages, um, but it also sets out our, our ongoing priorities in terms of reducing fixed term exclusions, um, narrowing the gap of um, between um, pupils eligible for free school meals and those not eligible, uh, although we were very pleased to see a narrowing of the gap both at key stage uh, three and key stage four um, this year and Key Stage 4 particularly, we're now very close to the Welsh average. I recognise that's not where we would want it to be. We are uh, moving in the right direction and um, we, we are evaluating the additional funding we put into um, Key Stage 4 FSM provision last year. Um, you might recall the uh, £75,000 we made available to the four secondary schools for um, Easter revision sessions um, and um, other measures that the schools were able to put in place specifically to offer targeted support to those um, small, uh, that small cohort of, of free school meals pupils um, in year 11. Um, the report focuses on um, the drive to uh, accelerate progress by a wide, for a wide range of vulnerable learners. Um, we continue to drive up standards of leadership in our schools and we've had very successful arrangements that have been put in place. The federation between Lambie Hangle Crocorny and Lanfoist Primary Schools is working very well in the north of the county and that's that's a model we, we may wish to um, replicate in other areas given the, the success. Um, and I'd, I'd also like to point out the um, federation between the um, very successful arrangements between Caldercott and Bishop of Landeth um, schools. And some of those steps that we've taken to attract the brightest and the best head teachers um, into our schools, um, having that uh, key figurehead at the top of a, of, of a school is so important. Um, the report also recognises um, the need to ensure um, that our schools is our school estate is structured at in the right way. So um, we will be bringing forward proposals in the near future um, in terms of school places in the Caldercott area. Um, and um, as Mr McLean mentioned, there is some ongoing work in terms of uh, school catchments, um, particularly in the in the south of the county. Um, I agree with Councillor Grocott that uh, we, we do need to continue now at pace with our uh, 21st century school redevelopment proposals for uh, Abergavenny and Chepstow. Um, we're, we're also going to continue with our, our proposals to expand Welsh medium education because we, we do believe it's really important that parents are, are able to exercise a choice between English and Welsh medium um, and that obviously has particular challenges in a large rural county um, like, like Monmouthshire. Um, Mr McLean pointed out the um, lack of comparative data moving forward um, due to obviously there the were decisions by by Welsh Government which 
Um, I mean, some of the data that perhaps you've been used to in recent years is, is no longer available. Um, I do think it's important that we make sure that parents are able to access uh, reliable school performance data to help them make an informed choice uh, when it comes to school admissions. The school categorisation data I thought was uh, really pleasing. More green schools than ever before. No red schools. Um, now all, nearly half of our primary schools are in a green category and almost 80% of all schools are in the top two categories. So that's that's really pleasing progress. On school budgets, I wanted to pick up on the um, points made by Councillor Watts and Councillor Petruni. Um, you'll recall that we are the worst funded local authority in the country. And on top of that, in recent years, we consistently get the, the single worst settlement of the 22 councils. Um, there is, um, if, if we were funded to um, the level of the average uh, funded council in Wales, that would mean an additional £30 million for, for Monmouthshire in one year alone. Um, you'll recall this year we had an increase. We were grateful for an increase, but it was an increase of 3% whereas our nearest neighbours had an increase of five and a half percent. We would love to put more money into, into schools, um, but we have to operate within the confines we're in. Um, you know, if we were to try and find an additional nine million pounds um, to put into schools, as Councillor Petruni suggested, where, where do we take that from? Um, you'd be looking at an 18 percent increase in council tax if we were to to try and secure that unless you can you, you can find nine million pounds elsewhere. Um, it's it's very easy to say we should have every year in the last eight years kept um, school budgets in line with inflation. But obviously if we're consistently being given um, settlements from the Welsh Government, which are not just um, not just not not uh, in line with inflation, so um, you look at the last two years where we had a cut of uh, not, uh, minus 0.3 percent, the, um, the year before that minus 0.5 percent. That's not even cash flatline. That's it's it's not. If we'd had 0 percent, then that's that's a real terms cut. But we've we've got ca we've had cash cuts to deal with. So um, unless you're going to make really quite deep cuts to other areas of the council business, um, you, there's no way you can um, you can balance the books. But having said that, we've done everything we can to try to protect school budgets. But you still look at um, the comparison between school budgets in Wales and England, and on average um, per pupil, £645 is the difference in funding between the average pupil in England and the average pupil in Wales. Um, after 20 years of Labour governments in the Assembly, I, I think that's that's really shameful. Um, but we will continue to do everything we can to prioritise school budgets because our number one priority is offering children and young people the very best start in life. Um, but we hope that uh, decisions in Cardiff Bay will, will be fairer in future to, to Monmouthshire um, and fairer to education overall so that uh, councils like Monmouth are in a better position to put more funding into schools. Um, so in, in conclusion, I think we've made some really strong progress over the last 12 months. That's evidenced by our school Eston inspections and the whole authority inspection. And of course, a lot of that school improvement, um, school performance data that we've been looking at in this report today. So we're not complacent about some of the significant challenges we face and now particularly in terms of pupil vulnerability as we um, move from the shadow of, of coronavirus. So um, thank you to everyone who's contributed today and uh, thank you Mr McLean for your report. Just waiting for Mr McLean to switch his camera back on. Thank you. Right, can I thank you very much for that excellent report, for covering so much ground when you answered the questions. I'm sure members appreciated all the information that you've uh, you've given to them answering the questions so well. Can I also congratulate you and your team and, and thank you for everything you do to see all the children in CYP and the achievements you've made and the continued good work, especially during these difficult and challenging period. Um, so thank you very much, Mr McLean. Thank you, Chair.
Right. We will now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is a motion. And the first motion we have is from Councillor Eason. So can I invite you, Councillor Eason, to submit yes. your question? Oh, we have a squeak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. I, You've got a bit of an echo there, Tony. Yeah, I'm going to have to shut one of these computers down. Hang on. Hang on. Turn the volume off. Turn the volume off. Turn the volume off. You're muted now. Ah, God, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me now, Chair? Yes, can hear you. You're not right now. Something wrong here. Yes, can hear you. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Right, hang on. I've got to turn my volume up. Right, are we okay now? Yes, yes. I'm Thank you, Chair. Right. I, was, I, was I was sharing my VPN with Councillor Higginson and we were conflicting. And we're okay now, I think. So he switches computer off while I do my bit. Um, yeah, thank you very much for um, allowing me to put forward the motion. I'm pleased to say it's the first motion of the of the virtual age. Um, it's to do with the bus services, bus service in particular in the south of the county, uh, the bus service from Bristol to Newport, which recent, which previously ran through Caldecott, uh, Port Scoot and Mega, uh, was stopped and then run from Chepstow to Bristol to Chepstow to Newport along the M48. There is a question mark about the future of that bus service at the moment, and I believe in, in the Chepso area there are efforts to get the bus service restored. I support that need, uh, but I also suggest that as this is hopefully being, hopefully with a bit of luck, being supported by some funding from the Welsh Government, that whilst we can get funding from the Welsh Government or Monash County Council, or whatever, that we have some determination as to where the bus runs. And I would suggest and move the motion that should we be able to get funding to support that service, that the bus service is re restored to the um, the route it used to take so many years ago through Port Skewit, Caldecott, Roggett, Mega and Undy uh, to restore the service for the 20,000 people in the area. That's that's simply my motion. And the motion is really that we should contact the, the Welsh Government through our leader to gain support for that service and gain support for retention, retaining the service, restoring the service to the south of the county. That's my motion. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Eason, can I just ask you to read the motion out as it is recorded in our on our agenda, just to make it clear for everybody. I think you're muted again, Tony. Are we OK now? Yes, that's lovely. Yes. Now, this is a problem with um, with the team system. You need two computers to run to read one and not unless you have papers. Um, my motion is in light of the recent decision by Stagecoach to cease operating the Bristol Stroke Newport bus service through Monmouthshire, I understand that moves are being made to seek Welsh Government support to retain this service. Such that this may be the case, I move that this council supports any such efforts to retain the service. However, should any support be forthcoming that the nine wards in Sevenside, comprising about 20,000 residents, be included in the route realignment? The service along the B4245 through Port Skew to Mega was removed several years ago, leaving those 20,000 residents without a direct route to the Bristol area. This is an opportunity to restore the service. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I would, I would, we need to have that motion second before we uh, can continue. Do we have a seconder for the motion, please? Uh, Chair, yeah, I put my hand up to second it and to speak. Thank you. Carry on, then, Councillor Tony. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this service um, is the X14 bus service, which basically links Newport, Lower South Monmouthshire, and Bristol. This is a critical um, public transport service that links two of the major cities that many people and many residents in our area. Uh, go to for employment, leisure. So it's vital that we keep this public uh, service going. Um, I set up a petition, it's up to 230 already. 
So there is an appetite amongst people in the local area who wish to keep the service. Uh, I want to say a couple of things on this and I've written them down. One is, as we're about to talk about, oh, we're going through a, a hell of a recession and even before the recession, it, it, this provided a critical uh, form of transport for those people who wish to get to work and couldn't afford a car or were environmentally conscious and wish to take the bus. It's, so it's 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 going to affect, losing the service will affect more often than that, low income households getting, a, going, getting to work back and forth and at a time when we're going to need uh, people to get to work and hopefully find jobs in the coming months. Uh, this is not the time to lose this bus service. Um, it's critical to be linked to Bristol. Um, I know everyone's going to go through a downturn, but Bristol's been an economic powerhouse outside of London for many years now. It's critical for the lifeblood of South Monmouthshire. Um, unless we want more traffic crammed through Chepstow, which is already a nightmare, we cannot afford to lose public transport on this bus service because people, if they can and able, will just jump in their cars and clog the roads. So there's a huge climate change angle to this. Um, third, and I, might, I must declare, and just I catch this bus to work in, in Bristol. Recently, I've seen um, Bristol and Newport, uh, kind of a Western powerhouse. I, I think that's the, what they're calling it. And it didn't mention Monmouthshire, and I hope we're involved in that discussion. But we're certainly going to be exempt from that discussion if we can't get people from across the south of the county to and from Bristol in a in a way that is convenient to them. And just to uh, say before people talk about the train link at, uh, at Rogget, if anyone has att attempted to get on that train, if you can get on that train before COVID-19, you were crammed in like a sardine. I'm being polite. Some people were left on the platform often during peak times. Now, during COVID-19, there is no possibility, it's not even feasible for the train to take up the strain of the loss of this bus service. So what are people going to do? And with all due respect, before I hear another person talk about cycling, um, you're not going to cycle. Uh, it's not reasonable to, uh, to say to people to cycle um, from say Rogget to Bristol in a commuting in a commute peak time hour, uh, well, I don't, I'm guessing maybe an hour, hour and a half each way. Um, that, that's just not feasible. So I don't want to hear talk about cycling and walking and what we're doing. We need public transport that's fit for the 21st century and we can't afford to lose this service. Thank you, Chair, and I support this motion. Can I invite Councillor Pratt to speak now, please? Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Eason, for your motion. And we have been on this case since we heard about the proposed withdrawal. Just to give clarity to members, in recent years, the service has gone from Ch Chepstow to Newport via the motorway, with only the first and last journeys diverting through Mega and Caldecott on the X7. It's over five years since the X14 regularly travelled via Caldecott and Mega and was taken off due to a fall in demand. There is already a link on the X74 that runs through Mega and Caldecott to get to Chepstow bus station, so any subsidised service that we put on is not allowed to compete with that at its scheduled times. The authority is working with Welsh Government to seek a resolution to the withdrawal of the 7 Express X14 service in the short term, and we hope to have an update shortly. We have also been working with Transport for Wales and Welsh Government to look at a longer term strategy for the Chepstow to Newport corridor through the Metro Enhancement Framework and re regional bus networks to enhance connectivity between settlements within the corridor and the proposal will be put forward as part of this work stream. Our strategy is to see improved options for our residents to help them get to work and to reduce our carbon footprint. And I certainly will support any motion that supports our strategy. So I'm happy to support this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I invite Councillor Louise Brown next, please? Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say as a local member, I'm certainly um, supportive of keeping the continuation of the bus services for Newport, Chepstow and Bristol and have been contacted about this issue and have raised concerns with officers and the cabinet member at the end of April and I understand they've been working hard on this issue. It is of considerable local concern that the X14 service is no longer um, running and the 7 Express X7 from Chepstow to Bristol is stated as having the last service on the 13th of June on the Stagecoach website. It is a vital community service for the local area for wor working or travelling to Bristol and to help prevent the well-known pre-COVID-19 traffic congestion and air pollution in the Chepstow area. I'm not sure of the connections to the Faster 7 Express service from Chepstow to Br Bristol from areas in this motion, but it could be looked at to ensure better local connections to the express services from Chepstow, particularly at peak times. Temporary measures are needed due to the COVID-19 situation, because obviously uh, the demand isn't the same as it would normally be, and also a longer term solution, which I hope is found soon. Thank you. Can I invite Councillor Anne Webb to speak now, please? Apologies, I've missed Councillor Fox. I'll come back to you. Oh. Councillor Webb, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've been aware of this problem for some long time now. And in actual fact, the Cabinet member, I thank her for her report, has um, raised this issue with officers and has been working on this issue for quite a long time now. Um, I became aware of this um, from um, a resident um, living in my ward. Um, a lot of people living along the Wye Valley also use this service, so I will be supporting this motion. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, P Councillor Fox, next please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thanks, Tony, for bringing this forward. Yeah, uh, we, we're all in the local community getting messages on on this have done for over well, six weeks or so, I suppose. I mean, one I've got here, which highlights really quite powerfully, you know, uh, as a regular commuter from Chepstow to Bristol pre-COVID, the effect this will have on myself, my fellow commuters and others using the services beyond words. This will certainly have a negative impact for many people in our community, for the economy and for the environment, as it will force those people who are able uh, um, to use their cars. And I think, you know, that sums it up well. I think Dimitri made a really good point. And, uh, you know, um, we do have to move into an era of, of, of stronger and better and uh, quality public uh, transport. And we certainly need a service back in in this area. And I, I'm conscious your motion uh, recognises the, um, the, the the work that's been going on, Tony, and that uh, there's highly likely or we're hopeful that there may well be something uh, positive come out of the, out of this. But all of our communities along the Sevenside area really need this. And as Dimitri says, you know, Bristol is a, a fantastic hub uh, that we need to be able to access uh, um, and and uh, it's fundamental. It's fundamental. We can get there. Your, your, your motion, the, the, the clear line in your motion, which is one I don't think anybody can agree with, uh, disagree with, is that uh, it's where you say such this, uh, such, such that this may be the case. I move that the council supports any such efforts to retain the service. And that's the key line. And that's where I think we as a council absolutely should stand behind your sentiments. Indeed, they're all of our sentiments. And uh, and I thank Jane for the work she's been doing with officers uh, uh, on this. And uh, I'm hopeful that we'll have some better announcements in the near future. So I'm happy to support Madam Chairman. Thank you. Can I invite Councillor Watson next, please? Yeah, I, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I mean, I, obviously, I would agree with Tony. What we know is that many, many people in Chepstow already commute over. That's already been said. But I mean, our own stats say that we've got an average working age of 48. So uh, we need to bring that down. We need to attract younger people. And to do so, we need to build 17,000 new houses, I think, uh, in various spots. Uh, effectively, that means that the South is going to have to take a huge uh, amount of those houses. And we haven't got a proper public transport system. If we are genuinely um, intent on building back better, 
uh, sorry to use a kind of labour slogan there, but I think there is a broader consensus after COVID-19, if the world is going to be less materialistic and we're, we're not going to be driving cars, I kind of hope it is, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure, but we certainly need to push as elected representatives uh, for a better infrastructure. And I think Tony's done really, really well by trying to defend uh, the existing system. And I, I would say, just as a footnote, uh, a little while ago when I was speaking to the housing czar um, uh, over in Bristol, he recognised Chepstow, you might think this is controversial, is just really is a is a dormitory town of Bristol. Now, I know some people might get very defensive about that, but that's their mindset. So they understand the relationship that working people have with Bristol, and I think that's helpful. So well done, Tony. Can I invite Councillor Becker to speak next? You certainly can, Chair. Um, Yes, uh, I've uh, been running a straw poll uh, regarding the service in an action group on Facebook, which has got about 100 respondees. And I think the only um, thing that I would raise, obviously I, I back the motion and I think we need to retain our public transport, actually expand our public transport offering for all the reasons that people have listed. But what I would raise is that um, going back to what it was five years ago or even to what the um, route was at the moment isn't necessarily relevant. A lot of people have come forward and said it's just not suitable the service anyway that's why so few people used it that's why it became commercially unavailable we need to make sure that the service is not just uh, going to parts of the community but helping them get where they need to be we've got people who are healthcare workers who can't get to Southmead hospital easily you know there i think that we have to look qualitatively at the routes not just we need a route but we need to make sure it's the right route uh, possibly the right routes really sounds better to me uh, for the different uh, sections of society that use it for different reasons. Commuters aren't the same as people who, who are, say, in their 60s who are going over to Cripps. It's not the same people. So we need to be careful about the types of routes. That said, I will, of course, support the motion because I support any improvement in our public transport offering. So thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Can I invite Councillor Dimmock next, please? Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be very quick. Thank you, Tony, for bringing this forward and I support it. And Councillor Becker just touched on it. I think some public consultation also needs to be looked at a suitable service for people that have moved into the area. Francis, uh, Councillor Taylor and I have had obviously quite a bit of development in our wards. A lot of people moving over from Bristol who rely on that service. So thank you, Tony. Thank you. Can I invite Councillor Taylor in to speak now? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, yeah, absolutely right for to bring this motion forward. But um, I, I want to uh, echo uh, some of the comments that are made by colleagues, because I think we have to get the route right. Um, part of having an integrated, effective, regular and cost effective public transport system is by going to places that people need to go when they need to go there. And that has been um, a problem, I think for uh, buses, which of course are uh, privatised. Um, so uh, I absolutely support the council doing all that it can to retain the service. But I also want to mention that one of the key factors in um, cited um, by the company in, in, their, in their concerns around viability is the removal of the seven tolls. So members will remember that um, <laughs> Once again, I was probably uh, standing fairly uh, singularly in, in talking about my concerns about unintended consequences um, and uh, political knee jerk reactions. And I think that um, I think that that's one of the absolute reasons why we need to consider these matters much more uh, consistently. As Lisa points out, Councillor Dimmock points out, we have had um, a significant, I, I think, increase in um, people moving here um, from um, the Bristol and surrounding areas, and, and we welcome them. And we are likely to see a great increase in um, the levels of housing in, our, in, our, in, the, in, yeah, in the Sevenside area in the next LDP. Um, but you know, long term consequences, integrated public transport have to be part of our offer. Um, I think uh, I, I'm sure that I've said this probably more times than members would care to listen, but 
I genuinely hope that we are really starting to make progress um, in terms of sustainability and that we will understand and be more committed to making decisions which consider the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And finally, can I invite Councillor Hammond, please? Good afternoon, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, listen with interest to the debate, and I think even with the housing growth that's happened over the last 10, 20, 30 years, and then this part of the county has the greatest concentration of population, and the fact that the service ran at a loss previously, I think demonstrates that's prior to COVID-19 uh, in an area of high housing growth. I think it just shows that it doesn't translate into sustainable transport options. And that that's a lesson for how we see the county in terms of its sustainability in general and the LDP replacement. And I, I think I, I was going to go and check my temperature because I, I found myself agreeing with everything that Councillor Watts um, had, had to say. And I sympathise with, with Tony because I think within all our wards that have a, a rural ele element, and it's been the case in Lanellan and Landfoys as well, talk about uh, local bus services and needing further support. There always seems to be the sword, sword of Damocles over them. So, yeah, of course, I support the motion and I hope it uh, results in a positive outcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Before we go to the vote, would you like a right of, you know, to use your right of reply, Tony? Councillor Eason. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I think everything's been said. Uh, go to the vote, please. Thank you. Thank you. As we haven't got the facility to vote in the chat bar at the moment, so we're going to do the same as in the previous um, vote. I'm going to hand you over to Nicola from Democratic Services, who's going to uh, record the vote. Let me call your name, Shoto. Yeah. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, first, we've got Councillor Batruni. For. Councillor Becker. Sounds like we're all playing golf, doesn't it? For. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Blakeborough. Four. Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Dimmock. Four. Councillor Eason. Four. Councillor Edwards. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Fox. Four. Councillor Greenland. Four. Councillor Grocat. <coughs> Four. Four. Councillor Guppy. Service. Councillor Guppy. Four. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Higginson. Four. Can we look at this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Howard. Four. Councillor John. Four. Councillor Laura Jones. Four. Four. Councillor David Jones. Four. Councillor Penny Jones. <coughs> Four. Thank you. Councillor Sarah Jones. Four. Councillor Brian Jones. Four. <laughs> Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Lane. Four. <coughs> Councillor, sorry, Councillor Pavia. Four. Who is that? Councillor Powell. Four. Councillor Pratt. Four. <laughs> Councillor Roden. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Strong. Four. Councillor Taylor. Four. Councillor Thomas. Four. Councillor Treehan. Four. Councillor Watts. Four. Councillor Watkins. Four. Councillor Webb. Four. Councillor Williams. Four. And Councillor Woodhouse. Oh, thank you very much. The motion's carried. Thank you. Thank you all for that one. As you heard from Nicola, the motion has, has clearly been carried. So we will now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is a motion from County Councillor Batruni. 
So can I invite you to speak now on, on your motion, Councillor Petruni? Thank you, Chair. Um, do you want me to read it out? Yes, please. OK, that this council creates a fixed term tackling poverty and inequality coordinator position for Monmouthshire. We are about to go through one of the worst recessions for many years, and it's important that we have a post that is directly responsible for coordinating our response, and that is directly accountable to the cabinet member for social justice. Chair, I felt um, a pressing need to uh, put this motion down uh, because it feels like we're in a bit of the eye of the storm in the sense in relation to the economy. Now, we obviously all know about the tragedy of the COVID-19 epidemic. So it's affected some of us personally um, and, uh, you know, the country is reeling from it and we've got to stay vigilant as well. Absolutely. We can't take our eye off the ball. So I'm not trying to say we should start thinking about the economy before uh, the epidemic. But we now I feel that we should have AI towards the economy. And as Councillor Gruca mentioned earlier on in the meeting, um, he, I think he described it as falling off the cliff. And I would agree with that. Uh, if you just look at the, what the Bank of England has said, it expects unemployment to double. It expects the economy to contract 14 percent in the coming quarter. Um, it slashed its interest rates and pumped in a stimulus of, when I last checked, £550 million. Pounds. Uh, we know that the United States has uh, done a stimulus package of $3 trillion. We know, I think the EU today has said it's going to inject €600 million. Euros. So we know the economy is going to really struggle. Um, and, and in, and in defence to the Westminster government, they have also uh, started talking about the economy and to the Tory Chancellor, who uh, I take my hat off to him, who has announced the most socialist budget I have uh, ever seen in my lifetime, and probably will ever see. It's such a socialist budget that it would make even Jeremy Corbyn blush with yeah, the yeah. furlough scheme. Um, so, you know, completely supportive, completely of uh, that uh, of that programme. But as the Chancellor announced himself, um, that furlough scheme would be start to um, be withdrawn, I think in a stage process, but nonetheless withdrawn. We're coming towards the end of uh, payment holidays. We're coming towards the end of uh, for mortgages and for credit cards. And as the unemployment uh, rate goes up and continues to go up and we start to feel the real uh, ramifications of the COVID-19 um, epidemic, we are going to we're going to full fully see the kind of destruction, and I don't use that word lightly, of, uh, of what the virus has done, not only to uh, families and many loved ones, but also to the economy. Now, the economy, and I want to put this in kind of cultural terms as well, is I don't want the economy argument to be dismissed and we just got to solely focus on the virus because the economy, how it performs, will have a a drastic impact on many people's lives. It can only just it will destroy lives if the economy tracks that badly and there's no support. But actually, it would also destroy a generation. That is its potential. Now, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, but even the Bank of England says this is going to be the worst recession since 1706. I wasn't alive. So and it's going to make the 2008 financial crash look like a drop in the ocean. So that is the scale, the true scale of what we're looking at. Now, we've had lots of political um, to and froing over recent years, and I, I don't apologise for any of that because I want to keep the heat on the administration to focus on this gender. But now is not the time for that. Now is the time to really prepare for what is going, while well, we're in the midst of it, but really prepare for what's going to hit us. And I feel our current approach, um, in my personal opinion, has been haphazard in places. It's been brilliant in other places, but haphazard. It feels kind of un uncoordinated. We have different schemes and happening in different departments and different silos. And sometimes they talk to each other and sometimes they don't. And I'm not here casting aspersions. I'm not interested in casting blame. All I want to see with this motion is to create a sort of, and I don't care what you call it, and if it's permanent, fantastic. But we need to have the infrastructure now to support the cabinet member for social justice for this tsunami of that's going to what's going to hit us, not only us, but the rest of the, the rest of the country. And 
it's best to be prepared. If we've learned anything from COVID-19, it's to be as prepared as possible. And having a position which coordinates all our projects, that looks all the different grants coming in, what's effective, what's not, tying the great work which we saw from the seminar from Joe Skidmore, um, our kind of future projections of where we want the economy to grow. It's vital that someone in the authority has a firm grasp and I really wish and I hope we can get a cross party consensus on this. I haven't sought to be political. It's vital, absolutely vital we have this position. I really passionately believe that and that and that position can be accountable directly to the, the social uh, cabinet member for social justice and to individual councillors as what will happen when we start getting those awful emails about struggling with paying council tax, can't afford this, um, family breakdowns, you name it, we're going to experience it. And so if we have the infrastructure in this council, building on some of the great work we've already done on the community side and some of the kind of benefits and getting them out and business loans, building on that, I feel it's vital we create this position and I hope the rest of the council will support it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Petruni. Um, in the chat bar, Councillor Thomas has indicated he he's going to second your um, motion. Would you like to speak on it now, Councillor Thomas? You don't have to, or you can speak later. It's up to you. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak now if I may. Thank, yep. thank you. Thank you, thank you okay. Chair. Um, I just want to say I fully support Councillor Petruni's uh, motion um, from okay. going to the seminar on Tuesday, which was excellent and very productive. Uh, it's obvious that um, from reading that report and a national report uh, by the um, Social Metrics Commission, you know, poverty goes right across society. It goes right across the authority, number of departments, scrutiny committees. Um, poverty is, 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 as we all know, multifactorial. It, it's going to get worse, as Councillor Bertruni said, apart from the impending uh, recession, uh, which is going to cause increased recession there is poverty if you look at the figures uk 22 percent wales 24 percent uh, if you look at the education stats um people were in poverty one in five come from families uh, who where there, there are no formal qualifications within uh, the family and, and that that is a huge uh, factor uh, in my opinion uh, we saw some of the stats on tuesday delivered by joe skidmore very useful but in reality we need more of it and we need it in every ward so that every ward member and officers can build on that so that we can actually do something uh, and I, I very much commend uh, the motion that Councillor Petruni has made I, I, I think we've really got to do something about it and have a full-time officer at the senior level in post thanks thank you Right, I will now invite Councillor Sarah Jones to speak. She's first on the list. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and thank you very much, Councillor Petruni, for bringing this motion forward and highlighting what is going to be an unquestionable challenge in terms of the current climate we face and the foreseeable future in trying to close the gap in inequality and addressing poverty in the county. Um, I think it's really important to just again note and confirm that whilst these issues are going to clearly be immeasurably harder over the months and years ahead, um, they're ones that we were very much firmly committed to addressing through the approach that we've um, committed to. Um, we're going to continue to build on that activity and um, activities such as our social justice strategy is clearly going to be there to help us meet that challenge as we go ahead. But it'll be reflected, it'll evolve to um, reflect the, the new challenges in, in terms of the current pandemic itself. Um, on the motion specifically, um, I welcome your suggestions and I really do welcome the motion that's come forward, but I do have an amendment that I want to bring in in light of what's already ongoing activity in this area and also some plans that we've already got in early discussion. And I just want to confirm that this is not in any way trying to detract from your suggestion. Um, indeed, I hope you welcome the additional support that I'm going to propose today. Um, and I want to thank you for the positive contributions that you've made on this debate um, to date. Um, and I hope that you can continue to work with us in terms of using your experience to go forward in tackling this agenda. Um, so, Madam Chairman, if I may, I'd like to propose um, the following amendment. Um, and it reads as this, as part of our ongoing review of the community and partnership development team, this council will create two dedicated roles who will lead and coordinate the tackling poverty and inequality agenda for Monmouthshire. And then the rest of the motion is as uh, Councillor Petunia set out. Um, 
Councillor um, Woodhouse, would you like me to put that into the, um, the the text into the chat function so everyone can see that clearly? Yes, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you, Councillor Jones. We'll give you a moment to type it in. Thank you. Yes, we can see that. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious I need a seconder before being able to speak to the amendment. I think Councillor Fox might have seconded that, but you yes. might want to just confirm that for me. Yes, it is in the chat bar. Councillor Fox has seconded the amendment, so we are now debating the amendment to the motion that Councillor Sarah Jones has put into the chat bar. Give everybody time to read your amendment. Can I make my explanation then for the amendment, if that's OK, Madam Chairman? Yes, please go ahead. OK, so just as I say, I mean, again, just to confirm, this is not any, any way to detract from what the um, the focus of this motion is all about, which I, I totally support. Um, the reasons, again, for the amendment are twofold. It recognises the work that's already happening in terms of repurposing our community and partnership development team. Um, and that's been happening both prior to and now in light of the COVID pandemic. And it's around that evolving nature of, of community development and what that's going to look like going forward. And secondly, it provides assurances that we will have not one but two dedicated officers whose role will be to lead on tackling poverty and inequality in the county. Um, I think it's important to recognise that um, we want to ensure that we have a coordinated position, but that person is clearly going to need someone to support um, under that. Um, just to provide some further context, um, we've been undertaking an internal review, as I say, of the community partnership and development team. Um, and that was to determine if the, the team itself were delivering against um, the remit. And that, that remit was very clear when that, that team was set up. It was to be the bridge between community needs and aspirations, as well as the wider priorities of the council and its PSB partners. And we were just about to bring the findings of that review back to SLT and then to Cabinet um, before obviously COVID-19 struck. So um, as a result of the pandemic, quite clearly that team, their workers and that their role has pivoted um, in terms of their delivery model. And they've had to work across all directorates and that wider community and partners to ensure that we're really de delivering for um, vulnerable people in our communities. Now, on the face of it, and I'm sure every councillor will have seen the fantastic work that the community partnership team have been involved in over recent weeks. This work has been work going exceedingly well, and the team are now undertaking a further piece of work to review how it's gone, um, what aspects of the revised service we need to make sure we build upon, what we can improve on, and indeed how we can measure the performance of that team. So, um, as I say, the importance of just reflecting on that as part of the motion is to give context to where we're at at the moment. Um, and just to give members some assurances around that piece of work, um, we will bring the results of that revised work back to Cabinet um, with some recommendations, either in July or possibly September. I'm conscious of the need to, to consult with strong communities and the wider select committees on that piece of work. So it might be we need to give ourselves an extra month or two around that. And then it's important to flag in this in terms of the two additional roles that I'm proposing. So those roles will build on the request of Councillor Petruni's motion. It's committing, as I say, to two specific roles and they will sit within that team and they will focus on coordinating and delivering against the challenge of tackling poverty and addressing inequality in our county. Um, we clearly need some time to draft job descriptions and to, to address how that's going to look and obviously liaise with the individuals that will take on those roles. And again, I propose to come back and um, report back to members before the next council meeting in the middle of July to give you um, the details around what those roles will look like. Um, so just in summary, I hope that gives all members and Councillor Petruni the assurances that we remain fundamentally committed to addressing inequality in the county and tackling poverty. We fully understand the huge impact that has on both individuals and our communities. And finally, I'd just like to thank um, the two speakers that have, have taken part so far, Councillor Petruni and Councillor Thomas. Thank you for the recognition of the work of the community partnership team. Quite rightly, you recognise the fantastic role that they play and they're going to continue to play over the coming months and years. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jones. I've noticed that we've got um, Councillor Peter Fox to speak next to, and he is second in the, uh, the amended motion. But as this is an amended motion, and it's, it's Councillor Petruni's amend, uh, mo amendment, a motion we are amending, I think I'll invite him to speak next, if that's all right. And I just want to clarify for members that this amended motion is a new raised hand um, within the chat bar indicating request to speak. So it's amended motion two in the chat bar 
if people wish to speak on this amendment. Thank you. Councillor Tooney. Chair, um, if, if it makes life easier, happy to accept the amendment and happy to put it straight to the vote and then we can just follow um, the original speakers um, as set out before the amended motion. Um, I look forward to the detail Councillor Jones will set out, particularly as she knows from the seminar, I, I have some concerns around how much pressure we put on volunteers in the future because a lot of those volunteers will start to struggle themselves with uh, financial pressures. But I look forward to seeing the detail before I make any more comments on that. But if it makes life a little bit easier, shall we? I'm happy to set, support that amendment and go straight to the vote so we can talk about the, the revised amendment. Up to you, the Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we would need a seconder for your proposal to go straight to the vote. Do we have a seconder? I'm happy. Right. I don't know what's happened there. I've frozen. My screen's frozen. Is everybody else OK? Yes, yeah, Tudor Thomas, I'm happy to second that um, amendment that, uh, that um, Dimitri's put in yeah, that uh, Councillor Sargent. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. My screen keeps freezing, so I'm going to have to just hold for a moment. I don't know what. You're, you're coming across. Oh, I am. OK, right. So in that case, members, we will go. We will have um, a vote similar to the one we had last time on the amended motion. OK, so I'll hand over to Democratic Services. OK, or, thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK, so first of all, Councillor Petruni. For. Councillor Becker. For. Thank you. Councillor Blakeborough. Uh, Councillor Petruni, you ask for one and you're awarded with two. Well done. Four. <laughs> Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Dimmock. Four. Councillor Eason. Four. Councillor Edwards. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Fox. Four. Councillor Greenland. Four. <clears throat> Councillor Grocut. Four. Councillor Guppy. Four. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Higginson. Four. Councillor Howard. Four. Councillor John. Four. I think I'm using the amended motion and two motions. Councillor Laura Jones. I think you Four. use a Councillor David Jones. Four. <coughs> Councillor Penny Jones. Four. Councillor Farah Jones. Four. Councillor Brian Jones. Are there Joneses? Yes, there is. <laughs> Councillor Brian Jones. Wake him up. He's in a he's in a room with a load of other people. <laughs> OK, we'll come back to that one. Counsel Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Lane. Four. Councillor Murphy. Oh, sorry, he's left. Councillor Pavia. Four. Councillor Powell. I'm getting my name, mate. Four. Four. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. Four. Councillor Roden. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Thank you. Councillor Strong. Four. Councillor Taylor. Four. Councillor Thomas. Four. Councillor Trehan. Four. Councillor Watts. <laughs> Councillor Watts. Four. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. Four. <coughs> Councillor Webb. Four. Councillor Williams. Four. Councillor Woodhouse. Four. And just to confirm, Councillor Brian Jones. Four. Thank you. Yeah, so the amendment's carried. Thank you all very much. I'm just going to have to turn my computer on and off for a moment. So 
Just have a little pause, members. My screen is frozen. I'll be back shortly. Hopefully I'm back now, members. Right, so that was clearly carried. So that now becomes a substantive motion, which we will now debate. So if members wish to, we're going to go to the amended motion. The amended motion, um, raise hand section in your chat bar for you to indicate if you wish to speak. Yep. Can I invite Councillor Fox, ask Councillor Fox if he'd like to speak on this? Yeah, yeah no, thank, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank, first of all, thank Dimitri for bringing the motion forward and, uh, and thank you, Sarah, for the uh, amendment. Um, there's, there's no uh, political um, issues with this motion. The amendment is uh, seeking only to enhance uh, the original um, uh, motion. Uh, we all, I think we all will share the the concerns that uh, the, the that uh, that poverty is uh, growing in our communities and will continue to grow as we come through this unknown experience and it's going to get worse and, and worse I fear um, before it gets better um, and it's absolutely right that we build on the great work that Sarah and team have already been doing across the organization and to enhance that and uh, bringing two uh, uh, members of staff in will really help that uh, uh, along and uh, we saw a really great uh, seminar a couple of days ago which I think helped everybody to get a real flavour uh, of, of the problem we're facing. So I don't need to say anything more than that uh, I, I was second in the, um, the amendment and uh, absolutely support it and, uh, and uh, look forward to a, a, a speedy progress through the putting in position of those two new uh, people. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I invite Councillor Debbie Blakeborough next. Oh, thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, keep it short. Um, nice surprise that. Unprecedented times indeed. We're all in agreement uh, today, which is brilliant. Um, again, yes, um, thanks to Councillor Petruni for again putting it on the agenda. And it's brilliant that uh, Councillor uh, Sarah Jones is, is supporting that um, twofold, really. Um, it, yeah, I think it's just very important uh, to have that issue uh, on the agenda. Uh, it's acknowledging that there are going to be extremely uh, difficult times ahead and we need to be, if you like, prepared to pick up the pieces. Um, as you say, you know, we're looking at lost jobs, lost income, lost homes in many cases, um, a, a loss of security and, and I guess for a lot of people, a, a loss of a future. Um, it does bring me to think in terms of Monmouthshire as a whole, and I don't know um, what Councillor Fox feels about this, but there probably needs to be big changes <clears throat> just in terms of a new strategy and new priorities for Monmouthshire County Council, uh, because what we had before COVID-19, I think it's it's very, very different uh, looking into the, the uh, future with the, um, the impending economic crisis. Um, uh, um, I think when looking at it, you know, it's definitely two new jobs. Um, but, you know, it, is there a, a thought of having um, a task force group so that we have a look at that strategy and we just keep that um, on, on the agenda and keep really focused? Because I think it is about this new focus, um, having regular updates, uh, uh, progress updates. Um, 
the role of tackling poverty and inequalities um, should be embedded in every job description. I think it's the responsibility of every officer in every department and obviously all members as well. Um, um, and I don't know if anybody knows, there's a role that I've come across and I don't really know what it is. It's um, a role that um, through the cracks officer, I don't know if anybody can tell me what that is, um, I'm assuming it's about a role to pick up pieces or, or pick up people who, who've, who've missed out on opportunities or falling through the cracks in terms of uh, our service delivery. And I don't know how that fits in uh, with all of this. But um, yeah, difficult times ahead. And uh, yeah, I've absolutely supported this. So that, that's a brilliant move. Thank you. Can I invite Councillor Terry Williams to come in next, please? Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully it's working. Um, I think from my point of view, there are many strands to this, and I think what Councillor Blake Blair said just now, you know, rings true. We're going to need um, a link up with an industrial strategy, a leisure and tourism one, and mainly from Monmouthshire, certainly majorly rather, is the hospitality sector. You only have to walk through the town of Abergavenny and see the devastation that we've had so far. Um, many employers are going to use furlough as a means to uh, consult on redundancies. And when this is all said and done and people are starting to go back to work, how many of those are actually going to have anything to go back to? It's a major concern. Um, we're going to need some local plans uh, as Councillor Blake said, um, a strategy that that really starts from scratch to where we are now. Everything that we've done in the past, you know, sort of becomes redundant in itself. I think. Um, how can we support redundant workers locally? Is there a role for the local authority, maybe, to increase our apprenticeships for the young people? Um, and what's the income going to be? The impact of our income going to be on you know car parking charges you're going to go to wander through and see car parks empty the hit that we as a council are taking must be immense um it's really sad how can we support people who are being made redundant what can we do with them to encourage them many of the the hospitality sector are migrant workers and of course when the b word kicks in at the end of the year we don't know the effect of that either that alone was going to be a, a major problem and again, is there a role in this for the city region to to do a, a refocus and a bit of a rethink to perhaps um, come in and support people? So I'm fully in support of the motion. Um, we've had experience of the COVID virus in the house. It takes a major hit on the income. Make no mistake about it. We've been lucky that we've had jobs to go back to. My wife's gone back now, traveling all over Sevenside, looking after the elderly. But those people that don't have that to go back to, it's going to be a major problem. And I think, as, as Councillor Blakeborough said, the um, poverty and exclusion and all that sort of stuff underpins everything else that we do. And I think there's probably cause for a major piece of work to, to try and support everybody as best we can. And I don't envy any of you doing it. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Can I invite Councillor Taylor in now, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, really positive to see Councillor Batruni's um, uh, motion amended. Um, in fact, uh, it was our group's um, <clears throat> thought that we were going to propose an amendment that hadn't already occurred um, because fundamentally we absolutely support the principle of Councillor Batruni's motion. However, I think it's probably true to say that we discussed very much that this requires a, a refocus of the whole council's business. Um, so that every officer uh, across their portfolios have a focus on um, poverty and inequality. Councillor Petruni highlights um, that undoubtedly those who will suffer the greatest consequences from COVID-19 will be those on the lowest income, those who are already excluded. Uh, we all know that poverty and inequality costs lives and we know that it already prior to COVID cost the economy in Wales probably around four billion in the social consequences of poverty. Um, however, poverty is very complex and um, we all acknowledge the great work that our community and partnerships team has been doing. And so 
um, that was part of our suggestion that we refocus that team to to um, coordinate, I think, if you like, some of that work. However, on my experience, I've, I've worked in this area for a long time. It is not enough simply to have um, some coordination and to have some roles that are focused on this. Uh, nothing short of um, supporting the social justice strategy as you know the fundamental of council business will lead us to um, any productive outcomes for the most vulnerable in our county. Thank you, Chair. Next. That's my chat bell. And I invite Councillor Dimmock to speak next, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Bertruni, for your motion, and uh, obviously thank you, Councillor Jones, for the amendment. Um, it couldn't come at a more perfect time for this. Um, I just wanted to say that these last two months, my volunteer groups have been focusing on those who are shielding and most vulnerable, but I'm starting to see volunteers losing jobs and things becoming pretty desperate. So I think as it evolves, the need for support and help that group will widen, which is extremely sad. So I welcome this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dimmock. Councillor Harris, next, please. Can I invite you to speak? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I think we have to be careful not to uh, over promise here because it's going to be absolutely immense, the problems that we're going to be coming up against. Um, I noticed from the seminar last week that uh, Dimitri managed to let us all see the detail um, that had been drilled down in Clifton Ward in Bristol, which absolutely allowed anybody to see any problem whatsoever. And that obviously in, in involved collecting a great deal of data. And of course, without that data, you can't do a, a job because you don't know <laughs> you don't know what you're doing, basically. Um, so I think it's important that these two people start looking at the most deprived wards and get as many volunteers as possible to drill down like they have done in Clifton Ward in, uh, in Bristol. We can then focus on the really hierarchy of problems that we're going to see coming from uh, uh, such a, an amount of work. Um, I hope we can do that and obviously I fully support the uh, the motion, the amended motion as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Before I invite um, Councillor Petroni to give a right of reply, does anybody else wish to speak on this? I'm conscious that we've got two tables of raised hands and it could be a little bit confusing especially the first time we're using it. So if anybody else wishes to speak, please click raise your hand in the amended motion bar, amended motion column in the chat bar, amended motion two. I'll give you a moment or two to find it. If not, we'll go to Councillor Petruni for his right of reply. I think we'll go to Councillor Petruni. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank colleagues um, and the Cabinet member uh, for their contribution and to the leader. I just want to say two things quickly. Uh, one is, um, Councillor Harris is right, we shouldn't overpromise, but I want to reiterate, it's not about solving these problems, it's going to be unsolvable, certainly alone, but it's about being prepared, which can we can cushion some people from this and we should do, be able to do so. Uh, when we can. Uh, second, to speak to about Councillor Taylor's point around um, shifting, I think I'm paraphrasing, shifting the whole organisation. I sort of, I, I kind of see where you're going with that. The one thing I would say is, I, I fear in that process you you risk dilution, and at least with a, a post that can at least oversee what other departments are doing in this agenda is a, a vital cog in that if we were to shift such an, uh, such the uh, the organisation towards that agenda. That's the only thing I would say. Other than that, Chair, let's go to the vote. 
Thank you, Councillor Petroni. I'll now hand back over to Nicola to, for the recorded vote. Thank you, Nicola. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, OK, so Councillor Petroni. For. Councillor Becker. For. Councillor Blakeborough. For. Councillor Brown. For. Councillor Davis. For. Councillor Dimmock. Go back on the agenda. For. Councillor Easton. For. Councillor Edwards. For. Councillor Evans. For. Councillor Fox. For. Councillor Greenland. For. Councillor Grocutt. For. Councillor Deppy. For. Councillor Harris. For. Councillor Higginson. Councillor Higginson. He's left my home. He's left the meeting now, I think. OK, thank you. Councillor Howard. For. Councillor John. For. Councillor Laura Jones. For. Councillor David Jones. For. Councillor Penny Jones. <coughs> OK, Councillor Sarah Jones. For. <coughs> Councillor Brian Jones. For. For. Councillor Jordan. For. Councillor Lane. For. Councillor Pavia. For. Councillor Powell. For. Councillor Pratt. For. Councillor Roden. For. Councillor Smith. For. Councillor Strong. For. Councillor Taylor. For. Councillor Thomas. For. Councillor Trehan. For. Councillor Watts. Councillor Watts. Councillor Watkins. For. Councillor Webb. For. Councillor Williams. For. Councillor Woodhouse. For. OK, the motion is carried. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you, Nicola. Our motion is clearly carried. So we will now move on to members' questions. And we'll start with the first one from Councillor Grocott to Councillor Jordan. Can I invite you to As speak? As printed in the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Grocott. Our libraries are part of our community hubs and before the lockdown were visited by tens of thousands of people every month. The virus is still spreading and resulting in untimely deaths. It survives on library books and computer keyboards, so there are clear risks associated with these services. Libraries are important but not essential and crucially, they are indoors where the virus poses a greater risk. We know that many people will miss library services and this council can be proud of its record in maintaining local services over many years. During the period our hubs have been closed, we've been actively promoting our digital services like e-books and magazines while using our YouTube channel for things like storytelling and sing-along sessions for young children. However, I want to be clear that we do not expect libraries to reopen in the traditional sense within the next few weeks. There's another facet to this. The staff that operate these services are currently redeployed and are carrying out vital roles elsewhere on contact tracing, arranging food packages and calling uh, sh shielded people, coordinating other volunteering efforts, calling businesses and providing extra capacity into our contact centre. If we reopen our hubs, these things would have to be scaled back and right now they're really needed. We will reopen services where it's deemed appropriate. For example, the post office in Yes Hub will reopen next Monday, the 8th of June. 
I've asked officers to identify the plan for different options that would enable some increased access to library services within when, when it's when the time is right. This could include the reintroduction of home delivery service or the creation of a click and collect service. However, as cabinet member, I'm not sufficiently convinced that this is the right time to fully reopen. Thank you. Thank you, Groka, do you have a supplementary question? Um, yeah, I'd like to, to come back on the comment that library books can in themselves be a source of the of contagion. Um, uh, and yet three of the five authorities in Gwent are planning to reopen their libraries. You see, suggesting that uh, councillors in those three authorities are trying to spread the virus. No, indeed not. In fact, there was a meeting earlier on today by the uh, Society of Library, library Chiefs um, uh, where the, the officers from Cardiff, Newport, Blind and Gwent and Caerphilly uh, well, no, Caerphilly didn't actually attend, but they were invited. Cardiff uh, will reopen a click and collect service next week, but Newport and Blind Gwent have no immediate plans to do so. Um, if you recall that uh, the bookshop um, Waterstones, um, if you when that hopes to reopen or when it does reopen, they'll be um, put in library, uh, putting books that have been handled on uh, trays and then isolated for 72 hours because I understand from the uh, scientific information that the virus will live on uh, paper and books for up to 72 hours. So there's no question of uh, our, um, risking either staff or, or, or members of the public. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Can I ask you for your next question now, Councillor Drupal, which is to Councillor yeah, Jordan? Again, as printed in the agenda. And Sir John, can I invite you to speak? Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Groker, for your uh, your first question. Um, our schools have established um, good methods of communication with um, pupils and parents, some of which were already in existence before the um, coronavirus um, outbreak. While there are others that have been developed in response to the lockdown. Schools have focused on ensuring a quality of access to learning opportunities for all pupils, but particularly those from vulnerable groups. And schools have taken a range of steps appropriate to pupils' individual circumstances, um, including providing resource packs to vulnerable pupils, such as pens, pencils, paper and craft equipment, providing printed copies of tasks where necessary on a weekly basis, preparing and sharing a range of home learning experiences to continue to develop and reinforce um, some of those key skills. Most schools provide a weekly timetable for pupils, including tasks for the, for the week, which can be completed at, at any time. Literacy and numeracy tasks are provided regularly, and most importantly, activities to support well-being and a healthy lifestyle. Secondary schools are providing specific tasks and supporting um, particularly year groups 10, 11, 12 and 13 with specific subject work. Ensuring that pupils have access to online communication wherever possible using a, a wide variety of approaches um, such as providing IT equipment and supporting connectivity, um, providing resources on school websites to ensure that access is as wide as possible and making use of existing parent platforms such as Class Dojo to communicate and to share tasks. Also monitoring the engagement of all pupils, including those from vulnerable groups and following up where it's lower than, than expected. Um, contacting pupils from vulnerable groups regularly to check on wellbeing and identify any support that may be needed. And schools are also maintaining strong lines of communication with parents of pupils in these groups to help them to support their children. Um, furthermore, the authority is discussing the specific support needs of identified vulnerable pupils um, as part of a multi-agency group on a weekly basis to ensure that support is both effective and timely. Now, that evidence that I just explained has been collated during the lockdown from a number of different sources, including surveying provision in schools. Um, this was done quite early on in the lockdown to determine what systems and processes were in place. 
we've surveyed the needs of vulnerable groups to um, support identified areas for both equipment and for connectivity. Um, our school improvement partners, the EAS, recently issued a survey to determine the level of pupil engagement across the region, including in Monmouthshire. And of course, we continue to have ongoing discussions with head teachers and others. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Joan. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor Grocott? No, that's fine. It's good to see one. Well, I, I was hoping to hear that there was uh, interagency co collaboration uh, and and interdepartmental collaboration within the authority to to see that the that needs are being picked up and met. So thanks for that. And you we'll move on to your next question then, Councillor Grocott. Uh, and again, as printed in the agenda. Councillor John. Thank you. Well, firstly, if I can just take this opportunity to thank once again our, our officers, teachers, all our school based staff for everything they've been doing in operating the seven school hubs in, in Monmouthshire, which are working really well, ensuring that key workers are able to continue the really important work they're doing. I'd also like to thank Mon Life staff, um, both leisure and, and from our outdoor education service, um, who operated the hubs during the Easter holidays. The process of identifying pupils deemed to be vulnerable was a shared process between social services and officers in our children and young people directorate. A system was established that identified seven different categories of vulnerability and then appropriate provision was secured for those with the greatest need. This development was in addition to schools own work in identifying and supporting their vulnerable learners and that commenced during the early stages of planning for potential measures to respond to the possibility of a COVID-19 related lockdown. For those pupils identified as vulnerable by the nature of their risk profile, 85 pupils um, were agreed, 85 places were secured, and of those 58 places were taken up. So that's a take up rate of 68.2%. So 27 places um, were, were not taken up. Um, the attendance rate of vulnerable children whose families have taken up the provision is 82.4%. For those learners with additional learning needs, 89 learners were offered a place, but we would expect a low take up given obvious concerns around pupil health. So we have um, 27 pupils attending, which equates to 30%. Um, and we've also worked very hard to engage with learners who are based at independent settings. Thank you, Patrick. I wonder if I could uh, just, just come back and, and, and uh, ask for a, a comment on those 27 uh, families who did not take up the place for their children. Um, the, these children might be on the at-risk register. I certainly asked specifically about vulnerable children. Uh, if, if, if in those 27 cases where the offer was not taken up, if, if there was concern about the safety of those children, was that taken further? So I, I should clarify, it's, it's 27 who are attending. So um, obviously it's 70% it's who, who, um, who are not attending. Um, right. And right. I, I think the, the key point to, to bear in mind there is that um, it's it's the parental choice, it's parents who have opted to keep their children at home. And obviously we, we appreciate that um, where um, people of any age have, have an increased vulnerability, um, the, the risk of, of coronavirus is, is significantly greater. So um, we, we certainly understand the um, the um, decision of um, parents in, in those um, cases to, to keep their children um, at home. But we continue to engage constructively with, with schools, with social workers. You know, what engagement um, with parents and families about wellbeing is absolutely critical. Um, and, and for us, that's the, the overriding consideration as, as we move forward. Thank you. And your next question then, Councillor Grocart, your last question. Um, interesting timing, isn't it? I, I, of course, asked this question 
uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, um, the Secretary of State uh, must have seen that I tabled it um, in the light of yesterday's announcement, but uh, as a, as printed. Councillor John. Thank you. So the, your your question was about um, return to school, and uh, I have to say the the Welsh government circle of trust is much wider than than any of us knew. Um, <laughs> members will have seen the announcement yesterday from the Welsh government's education minister about the return to school in Wales, and the minister set out her expectation that pupils of all ages will be able to return to school from the 29th of June. Um, that's pupils across all age groups. I know there had been um, considerable talk about particular concern about children in, in year six, year 10 and 12, those facing examinations next year. And of course that transition year um, of great vulnerability from year six into year seven. Um, but the, the minister made her announcement yesterday and she made clear that only up to a third of, of learners will be in school at any one time. We're expecting Welsh Government to publish further guidance uh, next week to help both local authorities and schools prepare for, for that return at the end of the month. Uh, officers have already begun working with colleagues both within the authority and with our head teachers across the county to start making preparations for, for that return. Um, given that we're in the very earliest stages of that process, I don't have significant details that I'm able to share with you today. But what I can say and um, confirm and reassure you that we are committed above all else um, to making sure that any return to school um, has the safety of both pupils and staff at its heart. We're also very clear that the function of check in, catch up and prepare is to promote well-being for our children and young people. When I met with the minister um, two weeks ago, along with my opposite numbers in all the other councils in, in Wales, I made clear my concern about the risks associated with the prolonged closure of schools and the, and the well-being um, of, of pupils. Obviously, there, is, there are some um, quite significant concerns about, um, and about a prolonged lockdown. You know, for a lot of children, it's really quite important that they get back to school as soon as possible. Officers are working now across the organisation to ensure that the practical aspects of any return to school are in place. But this includes considerations like limiting class sizes, more regular cleaning, keeping um, children and staff with um, coronavirus symptoms at home, uh, managing the challenges of toileting and first aid, staggering break times and um, possible reconfiguration of pick up and drop off arrangements. Yeah. So schools are um, aware of the wide range of risks and countermeasures that they will need to consider. But as further um, as further details emerge and our plans evolve, I will bring regular updates to, to members. Thank you. Did you want to come back on that, Councillor Griffiths? Um, I, I've actually been asked by a head teacher uh, and it may be too early for an answer. But, but uh, what are the plans for uh, families where the parents are teachers uh, who have children because only a third of children at any one time will be in school? Uh, and, and so it may be that parents are in school every day, but they will have children who would be at home. What, what happens to the children of teacher families? Hmm. So as, as you say, we're, we're still in a, a very early stage in terms of um, what the return to school will, will look like. Obviously, there will still be a responsibility to ensure that key workers can continue to access um, uh, childcare um, in a school setting um, for, um, for, for their children. We need to ensure that key workers can continue to, to work and do you know, a lot of the vital work that that, that they are doing. Um, we are working with, um, we are in talking to Welsh governments about um, about what their guidance will, will be next week. Um, and I think it's really important that teachers, uh, that it's made clear that teachers are key workers. They will be doing a vital, well, they already are doing a vital job in, in our hubs and have been since the start of the lockdown. Um, and it's important that where teachers um, have childcare responsibilities themselves, that um, they are able to access childcare so they can continue to do the really important work that we'll be looking for them to do in our schools from the 29th of June. So absolutely, they need to be recognised as key workers 
um, and you know we will continue to talk to um, head teachers, Welsh government, and others to to make sure that happens. So you know we certainly don't want teachers worrying um, about you know there'll be lots of considerations about the return to school, but we we don't want them to be worrying about childcare. They're they're really important workers in in our county. Thank you very much, councillors. So that kind of brings us to the end of members' questions, and we now move on to the last item on the agenda. The minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of March. So if I could have a mover and a seconder. Right. Move, the... move that, Madam Chairman. Right. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Greenland has seconded them. If ev Hopefully everybody's in agreement, but if, if not, if you have anything to raise on those minutes, please speak now or put something in the chat bar. Otherwise, we'll accept them as a true record and I'll sign them. Give you a moment or two to put something in the chat bar if you wish about them or to speak. All quiet, so that's good, that's accepted, thank you. So I'm delighted to say that is the end of our first virtual meeting. And I thank you all, you've been very patient. We've had our hiccups, but we've got there. And I think we must give a tremendous vote of thanks to the Democratic Services team, to John and his team, for everything they have done in leading yeah. us through this today, because the members seminars run so smoothly and you know when technical issues happen there's not a lot we can do about it except keep calm and john was very calm he sorted everything out and the whole team worked tremendously well and we thank you all for your, their support and i thank you everybody today because it wasn't easy for, for a lot of us who were not used to this technology and we've done it so we move forward now and look forward to our next meeting Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Well, You've been excellent. Well done, Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well done, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Good night. Thank you.